Bilal Saeed, who is the Senior Competition Counsel at Tech Freedom, where he leads the organization's analysis of the application of the antitrust laws to, conduct, uh, to the conduct of online platforms and tech companies, with particular attention on mergers and their effect on innovation and potential competition. From 2018 to 2020, Bilal was also the Director of the Office of Policy and Planning at the Federal Trade Commission. And prior to that, he was a partner in private law practice at Cadwallader, Wickersham, and Taft, McDermott, Will and & Emery, and Kirkland and & Ellis. Bilal also teaches competition and antitrust law as an adjunct professor at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me this morning. I'm gonna ask uh, the audience to hold any questions till the end of the panel, if you can, but we will reserve some time for questions. And um, with that, why don't we get started? And uh, I wanna direct the first question to all three panelists, but Sean, if it's all right, I will start with you. Um, I wanna get into this question of whether rulemaking in general is a good conceptual fit for antitrust enforcement, regardless of whether we're talking about congressional rules or FTC rules. You know, obviously, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's common knowledge, the antitrust statutes are written in very broad language, and we've relied heavily on the, de on the development of law through the court system, through a, through a quasi-common law development process or a statutory common law process. And our default rule is the rule of reason, which, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a flexible rule, it promotes accuracy through case-by-case -case adjudication, it allows us to account for nuanced facts, industry-specific considerations, um, and it, it allows us to onboard new economic learning as it, as it comes to us. Um, so those are some of the benefits, some of the drawbacks have to do with administrability. Um, the rule of reason leads to a lot of unpredictability. It is uh, notoriously expensive to administer. It leads to long delays in case resolution. It relies heavily on experts. It introduces a lot of complexity. So um, <clears throat> my question for you, what do you see as maybe the promise or the, or, and or the perils of shifting towards a rules-based approach and away from a case-by-case -case adjudicatory approach? I mean, does this kind of, kind of rules-based approach make sense conceptually for antitrust enforcement? Well, thanks, Randy. There's a lot there, and we have lots of time. Um, when we are representing our members, the U.S. Chamber, we represent everything from uh, small businesses, self-employed individuals, all the way up to uh, the world's largest employer, uh, which is Walmart, and everyone in between. Uh, we think antitrust's uh, greatest strength is its simplicity. And what do I mean by its simplicity? Well, uh, we think antitrust does three things. One, it's a law of general application. Uh, there are very few people who are immune from antitrust scrutiny. Uh, two, we like the fact that antitrust uh, is subject uh, to a standard which is commonly referred to as the consumer welfare standard. Uh, we're using antitrust as an economic uh, regulation on the market, not interested in addressing other issues that may be of importance uh, in a democratic society. Uh, and three, the third great simplicity of antitrust is the rule of reason. Uh, that we look and kind of do a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, that's a rulemaking term. Uh, to determine whether or not the pro-competitive benefits are outweighed by anti-competitive harms. Um, when you start to talk about those three core principles, which has been what antitrust has been about, uh, at least for the last 40 years, you start thinking about a framework that is very much different from rulemaking. Uh, you cannot be in a position to say, we're gonna have rules that are gonna be of general application, that are gonna be based on uh, the consumer welfare standard and are going to be governed by a rule of reason process. The two do not fit well together, which is why when we think about from a legislative perspective, uh, if we as a society have other priorities we want from the market that the market is not delivering, that is the role of legislation outside of antitrust to create a regulatory framework to govern that. Uh, and we think by mixing antitrust and kind of the legislative uh, rulemaking that goes on outside of the antitrust space, you end up uh, with uh, the worst of both worlds. Uh, and as a result, this kind of divide in terms of how we think about the role of antitrust from the role of regulation is an important one. Uh, and that's the framework in which we approach uh, our thinking about uh, the function of antitrust in the market. In terms of some of the, 
uh, downsides you mentioned as a result of, of having such a uh, kind of a constitutional uh, approach to having these three pillars of antitrust thinking. Um, yes, uh, it can be difficult to administer. Yes, it can be uh, expensive and costly. Um, but the uh, ability to apply that in ways, uh, in a more strict kind of per se approach, uh, and of course we're leaving aside for today's conversation cartels and uh, hardcore uh, price fixing type elements, uh, you run the risk of damaging the economy in ways that uh, have a counter effect that uh, you would otherwise want to have happening in the market. Uh, so the more you decide to put government imposed restrictions on the market, the harder it is for the market uh, to evolve, the harder it is for innovation, the harder it is for new startups, the harder it is for the formation of capital. Uh, and so as a result, it's important to strike this balance between having a rule of general application that is administered on a case by case basis and different approaches when we decide as a society through the United States Congress that we want to have a rule to govern something, uh, and you set that up and you set a regulator in place to administer it, but you do that outside the construct of antitrust. Bilal, let me ask you to either react to Sean or, or expand on any of his thoughts, but on, on this question, what, regardless of whether we're talking about congressional or FTC rulemaking, what do you think of this, this approach overall conceptually? Well. Conceptually, uh, uh, let me take a crack at answering your question. Uh, uh, you know, do we see promise and or peril in, in sort of a rule-based approach uh, to antitrust? I'd say there's um, no promise and a lot of peril. Uh, you know, I, I would agree with a lot of what Sean said, uh, but I think, you know, there was a period where antitrust was uh, almost rule-based. Uh, Tom Morgan has a wonderful textbook on antitrust uh, that breaks the, you know, 100 or so plus years of the Sherman Act into uh, different categories um, of um, sort of an enforcement uh, and judicial review um, approach. And from the, you know, roughly 1940s to roughly the mid-1970s, uh, there did seem to be um, a rule-based approach uh, offered, um, you know, by the by the Supreme Court, which you know, obviously trickled down to the lower courts, which was that most anything <clears throat> that a large firm did uh, was illegal if it had the effect of um, uh, either uh, excluding uh, competitors. In, in some way, right, or uh, in agreements with uh, competitors. Uh, and there was very little look to, you know, the efficiency or other bus business justification for the conduct and very little analysis of the um, actual uh, or even uh, potential uh, effects. Uh, and I think, you know, a rule-based approach uh, that, uh, attempts to identify, you know, conduct that uh, is problematic in all cases or with respect to, you know, some subset of firms, you know, is just likely to lead uh, to, um, you know, the, the, f the failure, you know, to look at um, efficient uh, pro-competitive uh, conduct. Now, the alternative, of course, to sort of a, a rule-based approach that is, uh, you know, based on uh, prohibitions, is either a rule-based approach that, you know, in a sense uh, codifies the um, rule of reason, uh, and that just doesn't seem um, useful, right? We, we have a rule of reason uh, approach in the courts and a rule, you know, that attempts to mimic that uh, just seems uh, superfluous. Okay, thanks, Bilal. So that, that introduces some maybe important distinctions about what kind of rules are potentially available, um, strict prohibitions versus attempts to codify the rule of reason in some form or another. Andy, let me, uh, let me pose the same question to you or ask for your reactions. 
It's my reaction. Um, markets can't exist without rules. Laissez-faire is a rule. Um, uh, the rules that Bilal was talking about from the 1960s, many of them were um, uh, deemed to be um, uh, overly restrictive. Um, uh, so there are new rules, and those rules tend to be overly permissive. Um, uh, so antitrust is all about rules. Markets can't exist without rules. From the earliest bazaar uh, and uh, flea markets in the center of cities, there were rules and regulations. Chicago Board of Trade talks about the, the value of having rules and regulations that facilitate commerce. So I think we're long past the point historically when we can think about trade existing in a global market without rules. The question is, what are the rules, and uh, what is the source of authority for the rules? Obviously, the subject of Concurrence's um, uh, excellent book that we're talking about later on today. Um, whether the rules are made by the FTC, whether they are made by legislators, whether they are made by the courts, we have rules. Um, uh, so the more important debate to me is, what should the content of the rules be? What are the best rules for this moment in time? Um, we'll talk a little bit later about whether the pending legislation is a good example of good rules. Um, but I think we really are past this point of saying should there be rules and shouldn't there be rules. And I'll say it again, laissez-faire is a rule. It's a rule that favors certain businesses in the society by its very nature. And the more we move towards non-intervention, well, that's a set of rules. Well, so to pick up on, on that point, um, we also have a set of rules that come from case law, from our, our antitrust doctrine. We have certain items which we expressly refer to as rules, the per se rule against uh, naked horizontal price fixing, for example. We have the indirect purchaser rule for purposes of conferring antitrust standing on uh, the first purchaser from a conspirator. Um, and then we also have uh, we have frameworks that we don't necessarily call rules, but that shape our substantive antitrust inquiries in important ways. We have, um, for predatory pricing cases, for example, we have the, the price cost test and recoupment requirements. We don't call that a rule, but that acts much like a rule might act in, in uh, limiting or steering an analysis. Similarly, in, in reverse payment cases after the Supreme Court's decision in FTC versus activists, we focus pay for delay litigation on the, uh, whether there's a large and unjustified payment. Again, we don't call it a rule specifically, but it, it acts like a rule could act or might act. So Bilal, let me ask you, you know, if you accept my, my proposition that we do have rules, that they just come out of case law. How might rules that come from a top-down uh, governmental authority, whether that be Congress or an administrative agency, how might those rules differ qualitatively from the rules we already have? What, what do you see as the important distinctions and differences there? Well, well let me take a little bit of issue with your, um, with, with your assertion. Uh, I think there are very few specific rules in uh, competition cases. Now, this may be definitional. A lot of what um, Andy said I, I agree with. Uh, it, it's just the form in which you know, we sort of analyze uh, uh, conduct or transactions. So, you know, I, th I think uh, the only substantive rule <clears throat> I can think of in uh, Section 1 and Section 2 law uh, and thus maybe Section 5 law, is with respect to uh, predatory pricing, the one you mentioned. Uh, now, I, I agree that um, the case law, as it developed, uh, you know, post the per se period, uh, developed, uh, you know, maybe rules of thumb or analytical, you know, heuristics to sort of uh, decide whether cases were, you know, sort of meritorious or not. Uh, that is an evolving process uh, from, you know, the 40s through the 70s, 70s through the early 2000s, and, and now since the early 2000s, towards a, uh, a what I'd call a more structured uh, uh, analysis. But uh, 
you know, I, I, I don't see um, uh, rules in competition cases, even in the, uh, you know, the, the, the per se rule. Um, you know, it, it's really naked price fixing and, you know, uh, market allocation uh, that is uh, uh, per se illegal where there is no analysis of the effects. Uh, but of course, there is some analysis as to whether something is uh, naked or not. Uh, so uh, how would I expect uh, rules from a legislative body or, a, um, or an agency to differ from the courts? Well, you know, if, if they attempt to mimic, you know, the rule of reason approach, uh, I think that's a mistake because I think it's very hard to, uh, you know, uh, codify that, right? Um, I think if they, you know, attempt to do something between sort of per se and rule of reason, which I think the, you know, the Klobuchar-Grassley bill does, you know, I think you run into problems of, uh, you know, uh, not an, an insufficient analysis of the, um, you know, of the, of the effects of the conduct and the rationale for the conduct. Uh, so so that's, that's the difference I see, right? Uh, the cases uh, over time, I think, are moving toward, you know, sort of the structured rule of reason approach, uh, burden shifting approach that um, folks like Tim Muris, uh, you know, uh, advocated for and that Andy advocates for. Uh, I don't see a way to mimic that in the rule, in a rulemaking process, either done by the agency or the legislature, and, and I see a lot of, um, you know, downside to trying to mimic that. The, the, I think historically, you know, rules have been viewed as inflexible. The more flexible they are, the more they look like the rule of reason, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it strikes me that there's no benefit uh, and significant downside in trying to mimic something, uh, you know, that, that, that is developing sort of organically. Um, Andy with uh, Steve Salop has a very nice article about how, um, you know, in, the, in, in most, in, in some exclusionary uh, cases, the courts are moving away from, you know, what I call rules of thumb towards sort of a structured burden shifting uh, approach, and I think over time, you know, through s advances in scholarship and, um, uh, you know, cases, you know, those, those burdens will be refined uh, in a way that I suspect a rule or legislative, you know, statute um, either cannot be or, or is just, just superfluous. Okay, so Andy, let me um, let me bring you in here. That's so. One question is, you know, are, is this just a rhetorical, definitional um, dispute Bilal and I are maybe having about uh, what is a rule and what is a rule capable of doing? Or um, and then to bring in, you know, he mentions your article with Steve Salop, which talks about. I asked him to do that. Uh, of course, <laughs> uh, talks about how. Um, changes in procedural law can be sort of a pathway to antitrust reform. Tinkering, for example, with uh, burdens of proof, burdens of persuasion, um, things of that nature. So let me ask you to react to him, but also to, you know, do you think, do you think rulemakings or, or antitrust rules from Congress or the FTC can be used to structure the rule of reason in a productive way? Um, so I think in general the answer is yes, they can. Um, and I, I want to pick up on your question of what is a rule, because I think that's a, a very important and interesting question. Um, let's not stop at the Sherman Act. Um, let's think about the Clayton Act, and the Clayton Act was a reaction to the generality of the Sherman Act and an attempt to fill some of its holes with more specific prohibitions. Now, we could call those rules. Um, uh, they were still subject to analysis. Um, I think what happened over time is the Supreme Court ch um, generally homogenized the Clayton Act and the Sherman Act in ways that were probably not appropriate to the intention of the drafters of the Clayton Act. Um, and, and that can get us in another direction. But the definition of rule, um, uh, part of what Steve and I tried to get at in that article is how courts use assumptions and presumptions 
um, uh, and burden shifting in different ways. And I think that it is fair to think of some of those things as rules. So let's take some examples from different sides. Um, uh, I wanna, uh, one thing that Sean said earlier about the certainty of, um, of antitrust being a benefit, I think it is quite certain at the extremes. I think we have conduct that is pretty certainly black and white bad, um, and there's a wide range of conduct that is presumptively lawful. Um, uh, and firms can engage, you know, post Sylvania, post Legion, um, unless you are a firm with significant market power, you have a lot of leeway today in designing your distribution system. True of exclusive dealing, all kinds of vertical restrictions um, uh, until you get into some um, significant area of market power, there's a lot of freedom. Um, so the rules are there and sometimes it's embedded in presumptions about what's good and what's bad. Um, to put a, a sharper pencil point on it, um, uh, in, in Amex, when the Supreme Court says in footnote seven that vertical restraints are generally good and therefore you must define a market and prove market power indirectly, it's kind of a rule that they've just adopted. Um, uh, you could debate whether that's an appropriate rule or not, um, uh, but they have embedded something. In Trinco, they're embedding a presumption that certain kinds of refusals to deal are okay. Colgate did the same thing with unilateral resale price maintenance. So we have these rules that are there, um, some pro-plaintiff, some pro-defendant, um, some pro-enforcement, some that have made it very difficult to prove violations. Um, and I think, as Steve and I argue in the article, in the case of exclusionary conduct, those have accumulated over time to make it very difficult to make out a case under current section two. Um, so are those rules, um, the way we use these presumptions, they're rules of law. Um, we advise our clients about it, we write about it. Um, uh, they're not rules in the sense of rulemaking or regulations but they definitely have narrowed the scope of antitrust and structured it in ways that are ripe, I think, for more discussion today. So, Sean, I'll give you the last word on this. Uh, you can either choose to address this question of, you know, whether what I'm calling rules would be uh, that, that exist in current case law are, are inherently or necessarily different qualitatively from the, the rules we might get from, for example, the FTC or Congress. Um, or, or just speak to this question of what is a rule? I agree that the market has rules. There's no debate about that. Um, when I was talking about rules, I was thinking about the context of rules within antitrust versus rules outside of antitrust. Um, antitrust does not have, as I think we've all discussed, a lot of hard do's and don'ts in terms of what businesses can and cannot do. Uh, one rule that we have not brought up is the robinson Patman Act. This was an attempt by Congress to write a fairly bright line rule uh, on price discrimination. Uh, that didn't work out so well. Uh, I believe the Antitrust Modernization Commission has called for its repeal. Um, we're now again talking about discrimination beyond just price uh, in the current kind of legislation that's up there. Um, and I would say that while we can have this conversation here about what is a rule and kind of the jurisprudence that's come from the courts that acts as a discipline on antitrust in a way that may make it hard to bring a, bring a case, um, I think all that's fair debate, but that's not what is being discussed legislatively. That is not what's being discussed by the current leadership at the FTC. Um, they are not talking about you know, trying to figure out how to address uh, some of these uh, jurisprudences that maybe need to be rethought uh, and reworked. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for conversations about the need for more enforcement. I think there's lots of room for conversations about whether or not uh, the, the jurisprudence has got it dialed in 100% correctly. But the conversation as I see it in Washington is about a much more significant restructuring of the law from top to bottom. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, when I think about the word rules, uh, that's what my members are most concerned with. Um, you know, most of our members uh, with any antitrust action, I've got members on one side and on the other of that action. 
you know, usually there's one of my members who's, you know, being uh, accused of a violation, and I usually got a bunch of members who would love to see antitrust violence brought against that member company. Um, so when we think about this and when I think about this on behalf of, of, of the Chamber of the Members, I'm thinking about those big tectonic plate type questions of what is the rules. And when I see what we're talking about in Washington, we're not having the debate uh, that, that you lay out, Andy, that is, you know, a more uh, interesting debate in terms of if the Chamber would be more pleased to have that conversation than the conversation that we're being forced to have. So th that's a per that's a completely fair and accurate point. And, you know, certainly so much of our current conversation about rulemaking is being driven by the rules that have been put in front of us, some by Congress. Um, the FTC, I don't think, has actually tipped its hand as an agency in terms of the substantive rules. It's it's pondering. We have clues from uh, writings um, from folks who are sympathetic to the views <clears throat> expressed by agency leadership, and, and we have some academic writing by Lena Khan and others. And I would um, just say very briefly that the unified regulatory agenda that just came out is silent about what the FTC might be doing on the competition front. So they did not give OMB any guidance about what might be coming for the next six months. There's a long list of things they want to do on the consumer protection side, but if you haven't seen, the Unified Regulatory Agenda just came out last week, and other than an HSR rule, there's no guidance there. Right, so and another good point. So, and, and they, so I think we have to, there's maybe <clears throat> a baby bathwater question we have to think about when we're talking about rules, and, and be mindful that we are the rules we have in front of us right now are a, a specific kind and subset of potential rules. Um, Andy, let me just come back to you again, you know, on, on, um, on the, the, the hope, if you will, or the prospect of rules that are more procedural in nature. Um, and, and to sort of get back to what you and Bilal were maybe disputing um, or, or just discussing, the, um, what could, you know, could you imagine a rule that accomplishes a burden shifting or, um, or structuring the rule of reason, a rule that came from Congress or from an agency, like what, what that might look like? Sure. Um, I should have started actually at the very beginning. I'll just add it now, a disclaimer that my views are my own um, and I'm not speaking on behalf of Howard University or Kroll and Mooring or any of their clients. Uh, sorry, I didn't say that at the start. Um, so I think legislation could be effective uh, in addressing some of the things the courts have done to create presumptions on one side or the other. Um, I think the merger guidelines will be a very interesting document because um, although they won't have the force of rules, um, it seems clear from the request for information that was put out in January that the agencies are thinking about presumptions and using them in the guidelines in different ways. The current guidelines use presumptions that are rooted in Philadelphia National Bank, assumptions associated with um, market concentration. Um, so whether it's by statutes or, um, uh, uh, or rules from the FTC, um, adjusting through procedure is something the courts have done. Uh, so I don't see any reason why rules couldn't be used in the same way. Um, just, you know, examples, the courts in cases like Matsushita for summary judgment um, and Twombly for motions to dismiss uh, basically adjusted the standards for the burden of pleading and the burden of production in the context of all cases interpreting the federal rules of civil procedure. They used procedure um, uh, to address their substantive concerns. Rules could do the same by creating presumptions. Um, uh, or by trying to push back about um, the incorrect or unsupported assumptions um, that often underlie rules. Um, there have been arguments, for example, going back years um, before activists was decided about some kind of rulemaking that would um, support the idea of reverse payments being presumptively anti-competitive. Um, so I can see using procedure as a tool through rulemaking um, to try and make adjustments. Um, and it is within the context of a broader burden-shifting approach. Uh, it's just suggesting that if conduct meets certain requirements, it is presumptively unfair, anti-competitive, uh, 
um, uh, unlawful. The statutes that are being proposed are doing that. We'll talk about it later, but certainly ICOA is trying to shift and elevate the burden um, by legislation uh, for certain conduct. So thinking procedurally, um, not surprisingly, I teach civil procedure, so, but thinking procedurally is something the courts have done, and I don't see any reason why, through rulemaking, the agency couldn't be doing something similar. Um, I'm watching the clock, and I know we have a lot more to cover, but I will just, Sean or Bilal, do either of you want to react finally one, one last time? Well, I, you know, I, I think the, um, the faith in the Congress in getting this right, um, you know, surprises me. Uh, I, didn't you know. I, I didn't say I had faith they could get it right. <laughs> Just, <laughs> conceptually, uh, it could be done. Well, I think conceptually, if there were a few antitrust professors up there, perhaps. But then I think what you would end up with is something like, you know, with Tim Yaris, uh, uh Steve Breyer, um, and maybe the Microsoft court, you know, tried to do with respect to section one and section two analysis, you know, which is a structured rule of reason uh, that uh, maybe creates, um, uh, well, maybe uh, 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 there's some underlying presumptions, uh, but, but basically puts the burden on each party to come forward with either a theory uh, of harm or benefit, and then maybe evidence of harm or benefit, and then maybe some uh, justification for the specific uh, conduct. Uh, and that is something to me that the FTC can develop through the case law or the Justice Department, um, and both agencies can develop through an amicus program and, and through, through case selection. Uh, the, um, you know, uh, again, um, you know, Andy and Steve's article mentions McQuain. Uh, these are cases, you know, there are some of these cases that Andy mentions that, that are FTC cases or that flow from, you know, the effort in, um, in three tenors in, in polygram, you know, to, to put forward a structured rule of reason for section one cases. Uh, and that also build on, you know, a structured, uh, you know, rule of reason in, in, in section two cases from Microsoft. So, you know, it, it's, it, again, I think, um, you know, th 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 this work can be done. It seems to me it can be done through the case process. Uh, and, I mean, if, if the idea is that a, um, conceptually, somebody smart could think about a rule shifting approach and conceptually that that could be the Congress well sure but you know is there any evidence that the Congress can actually think about this correctly and not and and not use legislation to target specific firms you know for non antitrust reasons I mean that's 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 really what's happening for you know at least some members of Congress so you know the only piece of legislation that I think would be useful um, is to clarify that the antitrust laws are not um, uh, uniquely or especially focused on type one era. I mean, that I think has been the biggest uh, 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 harm or, or created the, the you know, the, what, what Andy has suggested has happened that, you know, uh, certain conduct is, you know, presumed to be efficient or there's a thumb on the scale in favor of that uh, conduct. I mean, there is just no basis for saying, you know, the antitrust laws are primarily uh, focused on type one era. And even conceptually, there's no reason, if you think about era costs, to say that that's the era we should minimize, right? We should minimize the sum of the era of, you know, type one and type two errors. And that, I think, you know, would, would get us you know, back on track where um, it's not so much, to me it's not that the plaintiffs need a lower burden of proof. I think defendants should have a higher burden of proof of the efficiency uh, effect or justification for their conduct, in including, you know, the least restrictive alternative 
you know, whether it's the least restrictive alternative. Uh, so uh, it's a little bit off topic, but that, that would be my uh, sole legislative fix because I think getting there over time is going to be difficult through the case process. Okay, so maybe some, some shades of agreement, both uh, some, some agreement that uh, you know, procedural um, adjustments might be a potentially fruitful path uh, to address maybe what ails current antitrust doctrine and agreement that our current Congress might have trouble doing something like that. Um, Sean. Rand, Randy, if I could, I, I yeah. want to get to Sean, but I just want to interject something that um, Bilal said that I think is really important. We're not talking about replacing case law enforcement with rules. Um, uh, the, the idea is to broaden the range of things that the agencies could do. Um, and um, I want to put in a pitch for small cases. Um, I doubt the lawyers who argued Lorraine Journal um, uh, in 1951 thought we'd still be talking about the Lorraine Journal case. Um, some of the best cases that have developed over time were not the, the challenges to the largest um, corporations of the time, but we pieced together a case like McWayne is another good example where some of the best case law has come out of litigating good issues, um, polygram. Um, you put together your, your, your case book, um, uh, and there's really interesting cases from the FTC, like Polygram and RealComp um, and McWain, that really helped to establish some law. Um, uh, many of them drew on other cases, but it's not like you choose one over the, the other. Um, uh, it's that you need a, a portfolio of law enforcement and rulemaking um, uh, to put together competition policy in its fullest sense. Sorry. Thanks, Andy. So I, and I wanted to um, shift gears a little bit. I had a slightly different question for Sean. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier we've got these 99 bills that are currently pending in Congress that deal with antitrust and competition, and none uh, specifically address the issue of FTC substantive rulemaking. Um, my question is why? Uh, you know, given Clearly, there's a lot of congressional attention to antitrust right now, and uh, Dick Pierce is here and will be speaking later. He and others have written about the very high likelihood of protracted litigation that's likely forthcoming over whether the FTC has substantive rulemaking authority under Section 6G. So um, maybe it's a little unusual or, or, or um, th th that Congress hasn't yet sought to clarify that authority. And, why do you think that is? What do you think that says about congressional appetites for FTC rulemaking, or what, what do you think is going on there? Well, as a registered lobbyist who has spent uh, a fair amount of time up on Capitol Hill lately, I, I guess I would uh, maybe cite three reasons uh, that I can think of as to, to why it's not there. Uh, one is that for many of those who are the authors of the legislation, the, the legislation is a messaging bill. Uh, they're trying to send a message uh, specifically, and by you know, simply saying to the FTC, um, you know, go write a rule on something, somehow reduces the message I think they want to send. I think they want to, you know, members of Congress introduce bills all the time without the expectation that they'll get a hearing uh, or move forward. So I think for some, uh, it's, it's a messaging exercise. Um, two, I think, uh, and Bilal said this earlier, and we've already talked about uh, whether or not any of us have trust that the Congress could write uh, the kind of procedural uh, um, uh, calibration that uh, we might all find uh, reasonable and, and might agree to on this stage. Uh, and that is that, that there's not a lot of people up on Capitol Hill who know anything about antitrust. Um, they just don't. Uh, in fact, you know, if you go to the committees uh, of jurisdiction, they're often borrowing uh, talent from the FTC uh, on loan. Uh, and there's just not been uh, a lot of conversation from a policy perspective up on Capitol Hill on antitrust in many, many years. Uh, the oversight hearings uh, that they do uh, every year faithfully, uh, it's essentially you know, members asking about the merger and acquisition that just went through that they wanted blocked or you know, how are you going to approach this case that we know you're looking at. Um, you look at the kinds of questions that are being asked uh, from members of Congress uh, to those that lead the agencies. Uh, they're often, you know, void of, of a real policy uh, kind of uh, conversation. So, uh, 
Uh, there's just not a lot of people up on Capitol Hill who know a lot uh, about antitrust. I've been to a lot of the ABA spring meetings. Uh, it's not very often that the spring meeting invites anybody from Congress to come down and speak. Uh, in fact, you know, going back to a spring meeting a couple of years ago when the House antitrust uh, report was kind of being done, I remember calling Brian Henry, who at the time was chair, and said, you know, this thing may be coming out this year. Have you guys invited anybody from the Hill to come and speak to the ABA spring meeting? <laughs> and there was a scramble to try to get the legislative committee to invite somebody from the Hill to come down and potentially talk about what's going on there. So, uh, you know, answer one is it's a messaging bill. Answer two is that there's a, a void of understanding on Capitol Hill about antitrust. Uh, most of them up there are still hyphenating it. Uh, and then the third reason I would, um, the third reason I would give is that those that are knowledgeable enough about uh, the law in its biggest terms aren't comfortable with giving the FTC the authority. Um, so I would say most everybody in Congress falls into one of those three camps. Uh, either they're interested in a message and not actually accomplishing anything, B, they don't know well enough to know what to be doing because they don't, aren't familiar with antitrust, or three, they know it well enough that they don't want to give the FTC the authority. Um, and, and that's the reason why I think you see the 99 bills uh, not providing uh, the agency with any kind of rulemaking authority. Bilal, do you, do you care to uh, speculate as to the question of why none of the pending legislation addresses FTC rulemaking directly? Well, I, think, I, think, um, I am hopeful that we use, uh, use the microphone. For this. I am hopeful that the reason is because they remember uh, the FTC's efforts in the 70s uh, to enact you know, mostly consumer protection rules, but I think some thought was given to competition-like rules, uh, and, it, and it was a disaster. I mean, I think some of us, uh, maybe no one in this room with the few exceptions was practicing in the 70s, uh, but, you know, eventually the FTC became tagged with the, with the moniker of the second most powerful legislature in the United States. And I think, um, you know, Congress reacted to that. And maybe there's some institutional memory about that, um, what I would call mess, the FTC uh, uh, created for itself and potentially for the um, economy. Uh, you know, uh, maybe variations of that. Congress doesn't want to give up too much of its power. Uh, but uh, I am hopeful that Congress um, well, if it doesn't make clear that the FTC does not have substantive uh, competition rulemaking authority, uh, that they don't, that they don't, um, you know, otherwise clarify it, because, um, you know, it, it, it really, to me, was a mess last time, and I'm, I'm hopeful they remember that, that there's some institutional memory to that. Andy? Maybe they assume that the FTC has that authority. Um, so as we'll see on the later panels, there is certainly an argument to be made under 6G that the FTC has that authority. So some might be assuming we don't need to do that because it exists. Um, a second thought process might be if we start proposing it now, it will actually undermine the agency's ability to argue that it has it. Um, uh, so if you start legislating and proposing, giving more rulemaking authority, maybe it makes it harder for the FTC to argue uh, as it as some of the, um, uh, as certainly the chair has, um, that it has that authority. Um, but the third thing, um, which might also be the reality, and I think this puts together um, a couple of thoughts um, uh, that Sean and Bilal have mentioned. Um, if you contrast 6G with Mag Moss, it's pretty obvious that there's an asymmetry of detail. Um, uh, and it could just be that it is not so easy if you sit down and say, I want to draft a comprehensive rulemaking authority for competition rules. Uh, it is not going to be the most interesting or exciting issue. Um, and it would take some work to look at MAGMOS, look at 6G, and really think about, okay, what's the scope of authority we would prefer the FTC to have, and what should those provisions be? Um, as opposed to focusing on the substance of the, um, the law itself. Um, so I think for all three reasons, um, we may not be seeing, um, it may be sort of an interesting coalition of those who don't want to give the authority and those who don't want to undermine the argument that it exists. You know, I, I just want to maybe supplement that. Um, I mean, I, I, I agree with Andy that, you know, that talking about whether the FTC has rulemaking authority may undermine 
the authority they, they think they have. Um, but of course, the agencies, both agencies, have had, I think, significant success with guidelines and their adoption you know, in the court, both um, as, a, as sort of a, a, a process framework and as a substantive framework. That's, of course, mostly true with respect to the uh, horizontal merger guidelines. Uh, but I think it's also uh, true, at least with respect to counseling clients uh, and, and advising clients on what the agencies will do with respect, you know, with respect to the IP guidelines, the international guidelines. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was hopeful with respect to vertical merger guidelines. So, you know, you know I, think, I think you mentioned that Dick Pierce is here um, later today. Uh, you know, we, we did a we did a, a, a session uh, while I was at the FTC on on rulemaking with respect to uh, non non compete um, uh, covenants in, in employee agreements, and you know, Dick Dick was skeptical uh, that the agency had rulemaking authority uh, or looking forward that whatever authority exists under you know National Petroleum Refiners would would sort of be recognized. Um, but, but Dick was a great proponent of, of guidelines, uh, and I think, you know, the agency has had tremendous success with those, uh, both agencies, and, and again, maybe someone in Congress thinks, you know, that's an alternative tool that, you know, has a lot of pluses and few of the minuses of uh, rulemaking authority, both procedurally and substantively. Actually, let, let's stick on guidelines for a minute, Bilal. Randy, could I just, uh, sorry to interrupt. Sure. I want, it's on the guidelines, and I want to add to something that Bilal just said. It could be that a, a sequencing is appropriate in the following sense. So the FTC has withdrawn the Section 5 guidance that existed. Um, if you wanted to build a case for unfair methods of competition <coughs> rulemaking, you might want to first say what you think an unfair method of competition is. So guidance on the meaning of Section 5 could be a prelude to an attempt at rulemaking. But it would make sense if you were sequencing those to define what you think is an unfair method of competition first before you go ahead with a rulemaking based on that definition. Well, so that, an that anticipates the question I was going to ask Bilal, which, you know, Bilal, when you were, uh, when you were the head of OPP at the FTC, there were rumors to the effect that the agency was considering platform guidelines, you know, a set of suggestions for applying Section 2 to digital platforms that operate on two-sided markets. Um, can, you know, to the extent you can talk about that effort publicly, is that, um, ha what was the agency thinking at the time, and was there sort of a vision that this could be a precursor to either a congressional or an FTC rule? So I, want, I, I do want to be careful uh, that I don't sort of speak too much for what OPP was doing or what the commission was doing, uh, except to note that you know we were we were public about the fact that we were trying to draft uh, guidelines with respect to you know platform companies or what I would call you know allegedly dominant platform companies. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. Um, uh, you know, from the perspective of a plaintiff, and of course while I was at the FTC, I was a plaintiff, you know, I, we, I, think, I think I would look for the most um, plaintiff-friendly, you know, uh, section two uh, approach. And to me, that is the Microsoft, uh, you know, balancing test. You know, I think, I think you'll remember that in the Section 2 report that the DOJ issued back in 2008 or so, uh, they gave the back of the hand to the balancing approach, suggesting it was administratively difficult. Uh, and, and I'm not sure they used this language, but, but you know, there was a suggestion that it was it's a little bit too precise, you know, uh, and to turn on, you know, a penny benefit versus a, a over cost, it, it might be hard to do. But, but if I were thinking about this from the FTC's perspective as a plaintiff, you know, I would, uh, but, but also believed in some, you know, restraint and constraint on the FTC, you know, I would um, uh, try to make the balancing test uh, workable, right? Um, now, 
not a lot of Section 2 cases balance because it's difficult. Even the Microsoft case, you know, didn't really balance, right? It, it didn't weigh uh, harms and benefits, but it sort of found uh, no justification, mostly for most of the conduct that, you know, that, that it reviewed. Uh, so the short of it is, you know, this is in line with the approach I suggested earlier, that rules are unnecessary, but the agency ought to articulate you know, a framework for how it's thinking about cases, how it will prosecute cases, and then, you know, the FTC is sort of unique, or is unique, it can bring those cases in its administrative system, right? The, the courts have generally not balanced the way you might think of, you know, the benefits exceed the harm uh, for various reasons. Uh, but the agency might try to, to do that, right? Articulate a framework, uh, remove, um, you know, a step away from all the presumptions, right? Or the rules of thumb in uh, most uh, Section 2 type cases, you know, the exclusive dealing or arguably essential facilities, refusals to deal. You know, walk away from the uh, rules of thumb that are used and say, let's make this a balancing test workable. Now, the first steps to that are, are doing, you know, what, what I think Andy and Steve write in their article, which is allocate, you know, who, who comes forward with what proof, and, you know, are you, in a sense, competitively neutral or neutral on, on your presumptions about, about conduct. So, you know, that, that's sort of the short story. It was, you know, uh, the, it is in the, it, there should be an attempt to make that balancing approach work, uh, and like Andy and Steve recommend, uh, some recognition that um, maybe, maybe you don't get the balancing if the defendant is unable to show that it's sort of the least restrictive alternative, right? The, the only uh, section two rule that I think, you know, has to be, um, uh, recognized and maybe not subject to a balancing approach is, you know, the, the approach to predatory pricing, right? I mean, that is a strict requirement that the Supreme Court has laid out. Otherwise, you know, in refusal to deal cases, um, in the lower courts, so-called essential facility cases, uh, exclusive dealing cases, um, there is no firm requirement. You know, how much of the market is foreclosed varies across. The so, you know, there is, there is, an op is a difficult uh, uh, approach, but if they would, um, you know, if they would bring these cases in the administrative system, uh, they, could, they could try to make that test uh, workable. And that, and that was sort of the goal, right? Articulate a framework, uh, uh, arguably do away with presumptions, uh, and uh, and then and then you know bring some cases and make it make it uh, workable. I mean, you'll uh, just just an aside. Um, you know, the structured rule of reason in Section One cases. You know, the DOJ and the FTC sort of you know put put that forward in NCAA in the 1980s in their in, in the Amicus brief. Uh, the FTC sort of pursued those cases for a few years and. Uh, some of the interpreter cases, some of the, you know, other cases, they, they sort of got away from it uh, prior to California Dental, um, uh, but, but, but came back to it, in, you know, in the three tenors, uh, and that, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's taken time, but, it, but it, is, it has been helpful, I think, in developing Section 1 law, uh, and it could be helpful in developing Section 2 law. Um, and maybe, I mean, I, I'm no fan of Clayton X tying and exclusive dealing uh, provisions. I don't think they worked out very well. Uh, but, but, you know, it, it, it seems that, that was the intent. Um, that was my thinking in thinking about guidelines. Set a framework, use the FTC's administrative process to, uh, you know, to put some meat on it. And, and then go to the appellate courts. You know, I mean, people would go to the appellate courts. So, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Bilal, but I'm, I'm hearing a theme in some of your answers about uh, the value of, of moving incrementally and relying 
on history and past lessons, uh, both with respect to rulemaking practices and the history of MAGMOS and, and in terms of thinking about working with guidance on applying Section 2 to platforms. Um, maybe just for all three panelists, before we kind of leave behind <coughs> these conceptual questions about rulemaking as they relate to case-by-case -case adjudication, and we're going to get into the specifics of ICOA, which I'm sure everyone's eager to hear about. Um, Maybe just to sum up, just any, anything you want to focus on in terms of lessons we should be drawing from history. Andy mentions, um, you know, we have history with the Clayton Act targeting specific practices like tying, exclusive dealing, interlocking directorates, um, and, and relying on the courts for adjudication, but targeting specific practices explicitly. We have other examples where uh, Congress has regulated competition directly uh, in, in a more uh, bright line kind of ways, ways that Sean was maybe alluding to. We can think back to the, the fair competition codes under the National Industrial Recovery Act after the war. Or we can think of sectoral regulators, you know, transportation, communications, where people are reg directly regulating competition under a public interest standard. Um, we have a number of, you know, in Europe, all over the world, there have been a number of different approaches that we've seen historically for dealing with the kinds of issues we're talking about. Um, what, what should Congress, the FTC, what should we all be thinking about in terms of drawing the, the right lessons from history? Andy, I'll give you the first word. I think, I think balance um, in terms of how we approach things. Um, not overcorrecting, you know, picking up on something um, Bilal said earlier. There was almost an obsession with false positives, with pipe one errors. Um, I think that um, in litigation, fear of discovery costs, uh, fear of class actions, there's this sort of interdependent um, uh, reality that was created at the Supreme Court that led to some restrictive approaches to antitrust. Um, and I think it's overcorrected. And um, we'll get to ICOA, but I'd, I'd much prefer that we think about how we readjust and rebalance antitrust overall um, than going for, it's not even a second best option, but trying to grab a win that's directed at some particular group of firms. We'll, we'll get to that. I, I don't really think that's a wise precedent or a wise approach. Um, uh, so I do think there are correctives that could be done for antitrust. I think history suggests that we are probably at a good time for a corrective. If Congress could come around to um, a reasonable corrective, I think that would be uh, a good approach. But I'd like to fix the underlying law and not try to use workarounds. I think, you know, part of my worry about the rulemaking movement is that some think it's a workaround to the weaknesses of antitrust. And I'd rather fix the weaknesses if we can. Um, workarounds are workarounds if we have to, but um, I think it would be on stronger foundation if we correct the problems of the existing law. Sean? I don't know that I can improve on the answer. Um, lessons from history, I, I, I think, um, in each historical moment, there's also the politics of the moment, and we have a tendency to forget the politics of the moment, uh, but remember the historical outcome and then what came after. Um, and I, I guess I would say that we're in uh, a very interesting political moment. Um, and it's a political moment that I don't think uh, lends itself well uh, for uh, producing an outcome that will be reliable, uh, helpful, or will last itself uh, very long uh, in the event that it does produce an outcome. Uh, so I guess if I was to uh, say lessons from history, I would, would, would also say that people need to think about the politics of that moment uh, when those uh, times in history uh, occurred where we did something uh, to add the Clayton Act or the robinson patman Act or you name the uh, other uh, kind of statutory uh, addition to our antitrust laws or in the case of uh, guidance, uh, what was the political environment around when we issued updated guidance? Um, the politics have driven a lot of why we are where we are today. Bilal, last word? Well, I... I I agree with a lot of what Andy and Sean said. I, I think uh, 
I would like to see a little more respect for the two institutions, the FTC and the antitrust division, um, particularly in their sort of knowledge of, um, you know, the, the s both antitrust law uh, and sort of the underlying facts that may be uh, influencing some of this, um, you know, populist uh, uh, discussion on, on the Hill. You know, in the, um, we're going to talk about the Klobuchar Greatest Sleep Bill, uh, you know, um, there's, there's really very limited fact-finding behind any of this legislation. You know, there is, a, there is um, I think, some acceptance of the um, uh, papers out there show, you know, suggesting or the papers themselves, you know, arguing that competition has decreased across all sorts of sectors in the economy uh, and maybe that, you know, the agency's got some mergers uh, wrong. Um, but many of those papers are either bad uh, or not really applicable, I think. Uh, and what I, what I would like to see and, you know, is the agency's economists maybe working with economists from some other uh, uh, federal agencies, you know, sort of do, a, do an analysis of those papers. And, and, you know, the Congress maybe sort of think about what, what, what those um, analyses show. I think those analyses would show that the papers are weak uh, and they shouldn't be driving uh, changes in antitrust uh, policy. Uh, you know, and, um, you know, there, there's just, honestly, it, it seems to me the uh, current leadership of the agencies you know, is, is not doing the hard work that I think Andy sort of suggests, which is figuring out how to, uh, you know, where they think antitrust law should go uh, and using the tools they have, um, you know, to make, to make those course corrections. Um, and that, you know, I think that, uh, I, I was lucky, I worked for two chairmen that, you know, were uh, interested in fact-based analysis, you know, looking at cases, looking at um, empirical evidence, uh, looking at, you know, the, um, uh, the research. And I think, you know, the mar what appears to be the marginalization of the career staff, uh, particularly at the FTC, is, is just a great disservice, uh, not only to what the commission does, uh, but, but what, you know, the advice uh, that Congress is getting. Okay, well, um, it is a rule that at every antitrust conference in 2022, we have to talk about ICOA. So um, let's shift gears and do that. Um, I think, and I'm sure everybody is pretty familiar with the bill and its key provisions at this point, but just to sort of level set, um, Bilal, can I ask you to be the one to kind of just take us on a quick tour of the bill? Um, quickly, just given our limited time, just the key, the key highlights and, and things that should, Sure, I think I think I can do that. Um, you know, I think I think the bill prohibits uh, what I'd call three types of conduct: uh, self-preferencing conduct, which I think is uh, well, it prohibits uh, certain conduct uh, by certain uh, so-called covered online platforms, uh, subject in most cases to a material harm to competition standard, and I put stand you know standard in air quotes. Um, it, it prohibits uh, self-preferencing by an on, online covered platform, uh, which is, in effect, discrimination in favor of itself. Uh, it prohibits uh, what I would call uh, certain, you know, what I would call tying uh, by a covered, covered online platform, again, subject to that material harm to competition standard. And it prohibits if I read it correctly, discriminating between users of the uh, platform. Uh, again, with the nod to a material harm to competition standard. It provides uh, relatively few defenses uh, for uh, conduct. Uh, if I remember correctly, it has a requirement of uh, interoperability under some conditions. Uh, it gives authority to the FTC, the DOJ, 
and state attorneys generals to prosecute these cases, so it's not a, um, it's not, it, it, there's no private right of action. Um, and, uh, well, maybe that's a good enough summary. Maybe that's a good enough summary. Um, you know, it, it, it's clearly it targeted. To? It's clearly targeted at a small number of firms, a small number of platforms, either measured by, um, you know, total number of users under, you know, monthly or at some period of time, uh, and or either uh, revenue or market capitalization. I mean, my rough sense, it can't apply to more than five to ten firms, and the firms it does apply to, I think, uh, 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 you know, uh, Alphabet slash Google, uh, Meta slash Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and you know maybe maybe a few others, uh, and it it gives some. It's unclear to me if it gives discretion to the agencies to identify or or in a sense uh, bring certain uh, firms within the definition of a covered online platform, uh, but it's it's clearly uh, you know limited in in who it in who it reaches. Okay, thanks, Bilal. And, and um, Andy, I'll ask you, you know, if, if there are any other features of the bill that jump out to go ahead and, and highlight them. Um, one of the things I wanted to raise was the bill's treatment of data. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of provisions that deal with, with user data, um, limitations on platforms, use of participants' non-public data. Um, the platforms have to allow data portability. It also, um, the bill creates data security justifications that can be a defense to liability. Um, you know, the liability standard is conduct that materially harms competition. <clears throat> so at the same time, it, it tasks the agencies with, or, or rather the FTC, with, uh, with policing these data concerns. There's a section 2B of the bill also requires the FTC to promulgate regulations defining data. Uh, so maybe you could talk about just the data provisions in the bill generally, but also what does this mean to ask, you know, the enforcement agency to sort of police around and defend around these data-related issues and then also be responsible for devi defining what data means? Thanks, Randy. Um, you know, I think I made clear that I, I really do uh, believe we need some legislation to correct some of the problems in antitrust. Um, I don't think this bill is um, a good example of what we need to do. Um, and I think it's interesting that the bill has divided a lot of academics in what you would view as the progressive pro-change community. Um, lots of activity on Twitter and arguments between people that often are on the same side on this bill, and they're not on the same side, and um, I'm one of them uh, in feeling like the bill has um, serious problems. To more directly answer Randy's question and explain what I'm concerned about, I put it in three categories. Um, one is enterprise thinking. Um, the second is overbreath, um, uh, and um, and the third is losing the role of consumer welfare uh, in the process that led to the success of these companies. So first, what do I mean by enterprise thinking? Um, I think it is very troubling to try and uh, define the scope of the bill by market capitalization of an entire enterprise. Um, that problem then comes back at the end of the bill in terms of calculating uh, fines. Um, uh, it pays no attention to the fact that each of the companies that would be affected um, are involved in many different businesses and face different scope of competition in each of those lines of, of businesses. Uh, it's a crude way to, to get at a particular defined group of firms. We should all be very concerned about that kind of pro approach to legislation as a long-term precedent. It is a bad idea and it could be misused um, in the future. I'll, I'll get back to the potential for abuse in a moment. Uh, the overbreath problem, I think um, there are 10 specific violations, as Bilal said. Three of them require some evidence of material harm to competition. Um, the others, four through 10, shift the burden. They do use a 
procedural device, as we talked about earlier. They shift the burden, um, uh, which means that the conduct is presumptively bad, but it's not clear that it's presumptively anti-competitive. There is a possibility of some defenses. The defense section is split. There are some defenses available for the first three, different defenses available for, four, excuse me, four through 10. Um, but the bottom line is, is that there's a lot of conduct that is entirely benign, that is um, uh, conduct that consumers have shown they prefer and like. Um, uh, so I think the problem of unintended consequences uh, is a serious one when you look at the violations. Uh, I'm not sure the drafters have really thought through all of the implications um, uh, of, of what the bill would do. Um, and then you get to the back end where the fines are based not on the affected amount of commerce or the affected line of business, but again, it's sort of this death penalty we're going to take, you know, a large percentage of your overall capitalization as the fine, which means it's going to discourage um, conduct that might well be pro-competitive, innovative. Um, the last point I'll make is um, this focusing on these particular companies. Um, two concerns. One is it really ignores the degree to which the particular companies have grown and succeeded because they delivered valuable products and services that consumers liked. Um, uh, that should be of concern to anybody who's supporting the bill. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't have prohibitions of conduct that is anti-competitive, but it does mean you have to have some humility in looking at how those companies succeeded in such a short time um, and how you're going to affect them. Last point I'm going to make, though, is um, the potential for abuse that I see in the bill, and that greatly concerns me. Uh, why is there, and I'm going to use the, uh, the floating quotations, bipartisan support for this bill? Um, I think it's pretty obvious that to the degree there is bipartisan support, it's because there are very different agendas at work um, uh, on different sides of the aisle. Now, I'm not naive. I know that sometimes that's how the sausage gets made. You need some interests on both sides of the aisle. Um, but we should be particularly concerned, and the proponents of the bill should be particularly concerned about the agendas of the people across the aisle who are supporting the bill. Um, they see it as a weapon. They see it as a weapon against companies that um, have practices they don't like, that have politics they don't like, and we ought not be naive about that um, because this administration needs to understand it won't be the only administration that ever enforces this bill. It requires guidelines. Guidelines can be changed. Uh, it requires a definition of data. I'm sorry, Randy, I didn't answer your question. Yes, it has to have regulations on what data is. Well, data is not something about four companies. Data is something about the information age. Data is something that affects um, almost all uh, businesses today that rely in any way on technology. I don't know how the FTC is going to define data or why that issue is being punted. But in the end, the bill can be misused and abused by future administrations. Um, uh, it is a bad approach. And in, a different, in different hands, it will be enforced differently. And the model of let's adopt a piece of legislation and define it in such a way that it only applies to our enemies. Let's be more self-aware of the dangers of that kind of model um, uh, without putting too much of a point on it. The last administration would have had a blast with this bill. So I'm against it. Can we just jump in here? We're Thank you. Yeah, so why don't we, um, I want to save some time for audience questions, so get those ready if you have them. Sean, I have other specific questions of the bill we can come back to, but let me just ask you first to either react to Andy or Bilal or highlight for you what are the important issues well, with the bill. Let me, let me give some quick hits. One, I like your air quotes of bipartisan support because uh, I think there's a lot of bipartisan opposition, uh, and it amazes me that there's less talk about that in the papers. But let me give you some quick hits. Uh, the word consumer appears in the legislation, I believe, uh, in only one reference, and it's to the Consumer Price Index, but it has nothing to do with whether prices are going up. It has to do with whether or not uh, we're tacking on what market capitalization levels look like in the future. So consumers are completely absent from this legislation. Uh, when we talked about the defenses that are in place for uh, actions taken by companies uh, 
that are targeted for privacy and cybersecurity. Uh, those defenses, as I read them, are not on par with what the bill does for intellectual property and the defenses that are provided if they're protecting their intellectual property. Uh, so clearly, if you're looking at the defenses and the prioritization, IP is the most important thing to protect, but someone's privacy or cybersecurity uh, ranks beneath that. Um, we've talked a lot about platforms, and I keep hearing you say, Randy, two-sided markets. Uh, you go read who's captured. It's not two-sided markets. It is or, not and. You have to either have 50 million monthly users or 100,000 businesses. They didn't put the word and in there. We're not talking about two-sided markets. The definition of platform here is anybody who's of certain size. It's not a question of a two-sided market. And this has been talked about behind closed doors up on Capitol Hill for some time. The authors of the bill don't want to make that change. Why is beyond me, but we're not talking about platforms and two-sided markets. Um, you can go on and on and on with kind of criticisms and complaints, um, but let me leave you with this on the enterprise risk piece. Uh, when you look at the coalition of those who are supportive of this measure, some want to address content moderation. You got Republicans want to do it one way, Democrats want to do it the other. You got others who might say, hey, look, we need to have some kind of small business bill of rights for e-commerce. Others might say, hey, look, you know, search in the 21st century on the internet is kind of an essential thing and we need to have rules that govern that. You got other people who might say, hey, look, this kind of digital advertising market uh, needs to be kind of thought through and policed. There are four or five or six different fundamentally unique things that people want to achieve all through one piece of legislation that says thou shalt not discriminate. <laughs> thou shalt not sell preference. Um, the likelihood that you're going to hit the target you're aiming for uh, is the exact reason why I would argue to the degree to which there's a political need to do any of these things, you would do it as a standalone regulatory measure. You wouldn't do it as a part of antitrust. And yet we're trying to, for political reasons, capture that interest in order to find some kind of coalition that might make the legislation uh, plausible. Um, but yet, we're not actually addressing, in the 10 provisions that you outlined, specific answers to any of those alleged harms. So I'll stop there. You know, I, I would ask, you know, what is it that's in the bill that, that actually is, is necessary under antitrust law, right? Um, I think of the FTC's case um, against Intel where Intel was treating its um, users differently, depending on whether they, you know, adopted a certain Intel technology or, or not, right? I mean, they were, they were punishing, in effect, some firms and, and not others. That seems to me a perfectly reasonable, you know, uh, discrimination case in support of maintaining uh, a monopoly. Uh, and that is, you know, I think that's what the bill is sort of getting at. It, it, it seems unnecessary to me. Uh, I think of um, the Microsoft case, you know, with, with the browser, question of, you know, could, could Netscape or others get their browser on? Uh, and uh, I think of the Kodak uh, ISO case, both as self-preferencing cases, you know. Uh, it seems to me you can get at the conduct that they're worried about um, using existing antitrust law. Uh, you know, the, um, I, I want to go back to just the, the platform, uh, sort of the, the guidelines and the standard approach. Uh, you know, when the FTC closed its investigation of Google back in 2012 or so, um, you know, they wrote quite a bit about sort of the uh, preferencing on the search advertising side. Uh, and I think, you know, they failed there to think about you know, either the balancing or least restrictive, least restrictive alternative test. So uh, what I'm getting at is the bill creates problems, I think, for no particular reason. You can, you know, as I look at the prohibitions in, I think, Section 3, I think under, you know, existing antitrust law, you can probably get at the, the conduct you want to get at, right? I mean, you have to show maybe monopoly power, and the bill doesn't require anything like that. Uh, but it, it 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 really does strike me as a as a punishment um, uh, tool, and not a not a thoughtful analysis of whether uh, 
on the competition side whether these provisions are even needed. So Randy, I, I want to agree with Bilal in the sense that um, the worst anti-competitive behavior that's addressed under the bill could be addressed under current antitrust law if current antitrust law was working well. Um, uh, so I am sympathetic to the supporters of the bill who feel like it's gotten just too difficult to address some of that conduct um, uh, under current antitrust law. Um, but as I said earlier, I'm, I'm more sympathetic to the idea of fixing that instead of approaching it um, through the bill. Um, and coming back to the subject of our, our program today, rulemaking, I think when you have um, conduct that is not identified with a small group of companies, but is truly industry-wide conduct, and it's conduct that affects a lot of different stakeholders in different ways, that rulemaking can be a better tool for approaching that than case-by-case -case adjudication uh, or legislation like this. Um, uh, but working out um, uh, stakeholder interests before a judge when they're quite different, um, and I think that's part of this bill is trying to do that. It's trying to accommodate different stakeholders um, uh, in ways that have been hidden. Um, Sean alluded to it. Obviously, there is money behind the bill. Um, uh, a lot of attention has been focused on the lobbying of those affected, but obviously it's gotten this far because it also has supporters behind it. Um, this just isn't the way to work out these issues. Um, I think there are better ways to work out the issues. I come back to let's fix what's wrong with antitrust so that cases that really are competition cases can be better addressed. Yeah, and you used, you used the term workaround earlier. And you know, in a lot of ways, that seems to be, this is billed as antitrust legislation, and in a lot of ways, it resembles an antitrust approach, but it also departs in, in ways we're all grappling with. Um, we only have a few minutes left, and I want to see if, I can, if there's any audience questions. Yeah, Cecile. Hi, um, Actually, there's a mic coming. Hold on just a second. I appreciate uh, your having this event, and um, I'm curious because I see legislation that directly, that is directly aimed at the agencies, including the Hart Scott Rodino Act, um, being, for lack of a better phrase, uh, manipulated by the Federal Trade Commission, and by that I mean, there was a there's a there's a system set up. There's a procedure set up by the Hart Scott Rodino Act that says that you have 30 days to make your filing and get a decision back from the FTC about whether or not there'll be a second request. And we've seen that change into a whole system of pulling and refiling, multiple times, optional, and then these timing agreements that are being made and they're being, they, they started out at 30 days, and then it went to 60 days, and then it was 90 days, and now it's on its way to 120 days. Both agencies are asking for 120-day timing agreements. And, like, if they can't follow the legislation, what's, I mean, what's the point of the legislation? Because that's basically a change in those rules and how those are, they affect every merger that's being proposed. Can you speak to getting that sorted? Um, I'm sympathetic to it. The, the economy of 1976 is not the same as the economy of 2022. Um, the deals that the agencies are facing in some cases are enormous. Um, uh, and they may need more time. It's a fair reason to rethink whether the HSR structure works for all par purposes and for all cases the way it was set up. Because these are workarounds of, of a stressed um, and probably overworked group of people um, who are being faced with really large deals and they're having to make difficult choices with limited resources. So maybe that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, I, I have no comment on whether what they're doing is, is right or wrong, but I'm, I'm sympathetic to the challenges they're being presented with, given the timelines that have existed for a long time. Those, those 120 day periods are being used as punishment for some of the, the companies. If you do not agree to 120 day 
timing agreements, uh, we will uh, prepare for litigation, we will do X, we will do Y, and we will, we will detrimentally affect your There mind. is no doubt uh, that uh, since this administration took over and Chair Khan uh, and Jonathan Cantor have, have been in the chair, that they've done everything they can to frustrate the merger review process, to inject as much uncertainty as possible, uh, and in general tell uh, the business community they're closed for business at both agencies. Uh, we get calls all the time. We know of all kinds of things that are happening behind the curtain. Uh, some of this spills out in the press, others don't. Um, you make a good technical point that they are not following the law. I think uh, Commissioner Wilson has called this out quite uh, aggressively in, in a speech that she gave about this. Um, and I think it, you know, is part of the reason why I said that there's a group of people up on Capitol Hill who are not exactly excited about giving the FTC rulemaking authority, is not exactly excited about giving uh, Chair Khan any more authority. Uh, 13B is not something we're here to talk about today, but you know, what was supposed to be a no-brainer has now become you know, deadlocked in the United States Senate Commerce Committee. Uh, and there are Democrats on that committee who have signaled that they want to actually find a bipartisan way to move 13B forward versus the way in which uh, the agency would like to have uh, powers uh, created for it. So I think you're absolutely spot on from where, where we sit. Other questions? Alden? Oh, uh, yes, thanks very much. Uh, you know, and, uh, Andy Gavel made an interesting point about uh, rulemaking, and, but what seems to me one real problem with the current leadership of the Federal Trade Commission, which where you've had the chair uh, criticize and uh, arguably renounce the consumer welfare standard, you've had this, by a 3 to 2 vote this, this, uh, unfair methods of competition statement withdrawn. That makes it, apart from other obstacles, which we need not touch upon now, it makes it very difficult, it raises real questions under 6G. Under what standard are you, are you assessing the conduct? Is there a risk of, uh, of decisions, particularly if there's not a huge record, being uh, shot down as arbitrary and capricious? So it seems to me the FTC, in some respects, is its own worst enemy if it wants, wants to justify 6G rulemaking. They should be saying, yes, we will support, you know, properly interpreted consumers welfare standard, yes, obviously economics is important in studying practices, but they haven't really done that. Yeah, Alden, um, as, as I said earlier, I think that's why it might make sense in terms of sequencing to come out with new Section 5 guidance ahead of rulemaking. Because I think you're right, you need to sort of express to the world what is your definition of an unfair method of competition uh, as a foundation to build a rule that would implement that definition. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if, if we see that um, sequencing of new Section 5 guidance ahead of rules. Um, they may not do it that way, but it seems to me that it would make sense to say what they do think uh, an unfair method of competition is ahead of trying to use a rule to declare unlawful certain unfair methods of competition. Palal or Sean? All right, well, we are um, actually, oh, oh, I'm sorry, one more in the back. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Jonathan Barnett, uh, USC Law School, University of Southern California. Uh, the 2020 House Committee Report, uh, which I think uh, inspired and provides some of the intellectual leadership behind the legislation that's currently pending, in uh, passages um, of that report, it spoke in glowing terms of public utility models of regulation going so far as to praise the performance of the ICC, which is one of the most well-documented cases of regulatory capture and failure in US history. To what extent is the pending legislation could fairly be interpreted as essentially an effort to convert the largest digital platforms to permanently regulated industries? And the reason that seems to be at least a plausible outcome is that the legislation is so complex and the fines are so onerous that it would almost inevitably trigger something like an SEC rulemaking process, no action letters and so forth that would convert the most entrepreneurial companies um, in, the, in the economy into essentially regulated utilities. Thank you. So, no, it's interesting, there is a bill, we haven't talked about it today, but Senator Bennett from Colorado has a bill that would create a, a, an actual <clears throat> regulatory commission to, to oversee the sector. Um, that's not what ICOA does, at least nominally, but reactions? 
Yeah, I, I agree with Randy. I think that that's an extreme interpretation of this bill. Um, uh, and uh, I, we're out of time. I don't really think it has the features of public utility regulation. Okay, well, we, we are actually over time and we are eating into your coffee break, but please join me in thanking this terrific panel. Thank you so much, uh, Nicola. Uh, I'm very thrilled to be uh, moderating this great panel on uh, FTC rulemaking authority, and especially when it comes to unfair methods sort of uh, competition. So, um, and, and of course, encourage everybody to read the book where uh, a lot of uh, articles are truly uh, amazing and very interesting in the current debate. So, when President Wilson in 1912 uh, had this idea of creating a Federal Trade Commission, one of the main goals of the Federal Trade Commission was first to be an aid to the Department of Justice Antitrust Division uh, to help the division in terms of enforcement activities. It was also the idea to create an expert agency where you gather a lot of experts on consumer protection and competition in order to have a better knowledge of what's going on in the market and perhaps to better regulate um, the behaviors of firms. And so the idea of this expert agency was to also uh, issue some reports and draft guidelines and to gather information, to share information with the business community in order to increase so-called the uh, legal certainty. And uh, for example, well, the, the sections we're going to talk about, section 6G, say that the FTC should classify corporations. So uh, there's this very, um, very complicated exercise of information collecting, information sharing. But more controversially, there's one aspect of the FTC which is still under uh, discussion. And this aspect is the ability of the FTC to make rules. Um, not necessarily interpretative rules, but some sort of legislative rules. Um, so the question is, has the, uh, does the FTC has rulemaking authority? And perhaps the answer differs whether we discuss the two main activities of the FTC, whether it refers to consumer protection or whether it refers to competition. And, and so I'm very delighted to have this panel because we are going to try to decipher and answer these questions whether or not the FTC has rulemaking authority uh, when it comes to so-called unfair method of competition and should, uh, whether it had, well, what we can do and what we should be doing or what we shouldn't be doing at least uh, when it comes to uh, rulemaking authority uh, for unfair method of competition. The, the panelists you have here have written extensively on uh, the rulemaking authority, and it's a great pleasure to have them uh, sharing their expertise on uh, this topic. So on my very immediate left, um, which doesn't mean anything politically, uh, we have Alden Abbott, uh, who is the senior research fellow uh, from Mercatus Center uh, of George Mason University. Alden was a former general counsel of the Federal Trade Commission. Then we have uh, Maureen Olosin. Maureen is a well-known author and uh, enforcer. She was former uh, Federal Trade Commission chair. She's now partner at Baker Boats, uh, the law firm, and co-chair of the uh, competition uh, practice. Then we have Marina Lau. Marina is professor of law at Seton Hall University School of Law in New Jersey. And then finally, we have um, Richard Pierce. Richard Pierce is a professor of law at George Washington University. So, uh, without further ado, let's kick off the discussion on why are we talking about FTC rulemaking authority, and especially why are we talking about FTC rulemaking authority when it comes to unfair method of competition. So, there's a case for this so called rulemaking now, and it's very re reinvigorated those days in, 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 in DC. Uh, Marina, can you just tell us about why we have this uh, argument for rulemaking when it comes to unfair method of competition? Sure. Um, is this my? Yeah, it's working. 
So I thought since I'm the first speaker on the panel, uh, before I specifically address the question that you've asked, um, I uh, let me just spend a minute uh, to talk about the relative um, uh, re re roles of the FTC and uh, Congress to s sort of provide a context for this panel discussion. Uh, statutes typically uh, begin as broad statements of principle. And then over time, uh, these broad statements of principle uh, tend to take on more particularized uh, meaning through agency adjudications uh, and rulemakings and uh, court decisions with contribution from uh, scholarly uh, research. In the case of the FTC and uh, Congress, however, uh, the agency's role historically has been a little bit more limited on the competition side in terms of um, providing particularized meaning for UMC, uh, unfair method of competition. Now, it could be because that at the time there was already Sherman Act Section 1, which was interpreted very flexibly, and so maybe Section 5 was seen as a little bit redundant. Uh, maybe, I, I'm not sure. But whatever the case may be, in Section 5 um, litigation, competition litigation, courts have generally decided cases under Sherman Act uh, theory and Sherman Act uh, standards. And they have rarely looked to uh, the FTC for a separate understanding of uh, UMC that is apart from the Sherman Act. And even in adjudications, the commissioner has generally uh, followed the court's lead and have stayed within the Sherman Act boundaries. As to rulemaking, uh, we all probably know that the FTC has engaged in competition rulemaking exactly once. Now, I know that we have a huge debate as to whether there's authority or not, and my point is not to go into the debate at this time. Simply, I'm just uh, stating the fact that the FTC hasn't had a chance to shape competition law through rulemaking. So, uh, in short, I think the Commission hasn't really taken on the typical role of an agency in giving meaning uh, to important general terms in an enabling statute, so in this case, unfair methods of competition. Uh, there's little Section 5 uh, competition law apart from uh, the Sherman Act. So, um, if Congress passes the new uh, bill that is now considering, I suspect that might change because there's so many vague terms uh, that need to be given uh, meaning. So with that said, um, let me just return to Aurelien's uh, question at the outset, and that is why the growing interest in competition rulemaking after decades of inaction? Why now? Okay. I think there are two general uh, reasons, two main reasons. One is just a re renewed interest in Section 5 itself, um, an interest in using it uh, to supplement the Sherman Act as Congress had originally intended. Now, um, I think there is a growing sense that something is amiss with antitrust, that it's just not doing enough to deal with concentration or with market power in some sectors. And people who are saying that are not just the new Brandeis people, but rather traditional reformers, that something is wrong, that antitrust has become overly focused on false positives and uh, not focused enough on false negatives. That uh, some antitrust trust doctrines, uh, especially those dealing with exclusionary conduct, uh, that is dominant firm conduct, has become, ha has been construed a little bit too narrowly, like mm -hmm. refusal to deal, mm -hmm. exclusive dealing, uh, and so forth. <clears throat> and, uh, and since Congress clearly passed Section 5, uh, of the FTC Act to be more expansive and to, uh, to be broader than the Sherman Act, it's logical that if you're not happy with the way that the antitrust is going, uh, that you would look to Section 5 uh, for a path forward. Now, as to why specifically rulemaking? Why not just adjudication, right? And I think uh, that administrative law scholars like Dick uh, have long discussed the relative benefits of rulemaking and adjudication um, in an agency's implementation of law and policy. And Chair Khan uh, has uh, summarized those relative benefits in her co-authored article with uh, Commissioner Chopra, former Commissioner Chopra. I'm not going to go into those specific reasons, but I'll just focus and um, expand on a couple of themes that, uh, to me, have the most resonance uh, in 
uh, for, for the FTC. And the first is that, uh, the, uh, is that rulemaking can allow F the FTC to make better use of its expertise and its various uh, powers. I think some people who are not that familiar with the FTC do not realize how much power the FTC actually has. Uh, they have the, it has the power to conduct uh, market studies, to conduct investigations, uh, to collect a lot of data that they can then aggregate, uh, conduct hearings, uh, perform empirical and policy work, and so forth. So with all this power and with this expertise, it can really rely on the institutional advantage that is provided by these things, okay, um, and to, to formulate administrable rules uh, to help implement this UMC uh, mandate in a way that's harder to do uh, through litigation alone. Um, and if it's done well, I think rules can be used to operationalize um, the rule of reason standard. That's become more and more cumbersome in recent years. And I don't know if Andy is still here. Uh, well, that, I, I think I'm pointing to something that Randy had, um, Andy, I'm sorry, Andy, uh, Andy had said earlier, and that is, I understand that this is a little bit of a workaround, right? I'm saying that something about antitrust is not working too well. The rule of reason has become too cumbersome. The overcautiousness and the emphasis on false uh, uh, positives ha have made it too difficult to actually uh, apply the rule of reason and, uh, and, and win. You can win. You can win activists. You can win Mac McWayne, but do we have the resources to win a lot of these cases? So I understand and I do acknowledge that what I'm suggesting may be a work around. So um, another point that has been raised, um, and I'm not sure where I stand on this, uh, is that it can also be helpful in dealing with competition issues in digital platform and other complex technology uh, markets. Uh, there's already a body of literature uh, out there suggesting that uh, ex post enforcement under current antitrust law uh, cannot really adequately address competition issues in these, uh, in these markets because of some of the unique features of these markets, like features like um, um, network effects, economies of scope, economies of scale, uh, switching costs, uh, the importance of data and the inherent uh, data advantage of the incumbents and so forth. That all of these together tend to tip um, uh, to, to tip the market to a winner. And basically, it may change uh, the theories of exclusion. And so uh, what I think of, uh, what I think uh, rulemaking can do is that rulemaking can be uh, used to, can be a way to funnel these insights, uh, these leading, other leading uh, research and empirical evidence and so forth into formulating rules that can work. Uh, which can help address the competition problems that may be too large uh, to, to be dealt with through case-by-case um, -case, uh, enforcement actions alone. Uh, incidentally, uh, people who've uh, made these observations are not all uh, new Brandeis folks, uh, but they uh, do include some of the rather traditional antitrust economists. I guess the name that uh, springs to mind would be Jason Furman because of the mm -hmm. Furman report that he uh, authors, but uh, there are others as well. So uh, uh, the second argument, the only other uh, argument I'll talk about is, um, the other compelling argument is that uh, competition rulemaking, especially in very complex cases, uh, will reduce the costs that case-by-case case litigation and adjudication is very expensive, it's very slow, and it's very burdensome. You know, as I said earlier, how many McWayne cases can you bring? How many activist cases can you bring? So of course I realize that today promulgating a rule, a notice and comment rule, uh, is quite time consuming and is quite costly and burdensome upfront. But once a rule is issued, and once it survives judicial review, then adjudications uh, and decisions later on would be manageable and would be more efficient uh, because the use of experts can be reduced uh, quite a bit. So I think they can be best used when, when there's a high stakes issue and when it's an issue that recurs time and again. Um, in that case, rulemaking has uh, distinct merits. 
Now, of course, all of my discussion about the merits uh, presupposes that there's authority. And I'm not going to go into authority right now, but of course, without legal authority, uh, the FTC cannot issue uh, UMC rules, no matter how beneficial rulemaking may be uh, from a policy perspective, as I think it is from a policy perspective. Yeah, thank you so much, Marilyn. I think it's a great way to kick off the discussion. And it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the Furman, uh, which, uh, Furman report in the UK, which uh, pro <coughs> promoted this idea of ex ante rules, but also the Kramer report in the EU with the Digital Market Act. Um, and all these reports have this idea of ex ante rules uh, as opposed to ex post rules. And to echo the previous panel, uh, there are rules, but the question is which rules, adjudications or regulations? Um, so uh, I think once that we see the rationals of ex ante rules uh, because of quicker and, and, and a more expedite way of regulating businesses with some unintended consequence potentially. Now it's interesting to move to um, uh, Richard and to discuss precisely what you left, uh, Marina, is the legal authority. Um, what, what about the legal authority of the Federal Trade Commission to issue rulemaking, um, to, to issue rules uh, when it comes to unfair method of competition? Uh, Dick? So, so let me begin uh, by just introducing uh, my, what I think my role on this panel and in this conference is. Uh, uh, I've been teaching antitrust law for 45 years, so I'm, I'm not totally ignorant of the field, but I don't have the kind of detailed understanding of all the cases and the history of the field that, that, that any of the other participants have. So what, what do I have to offer? Well, I have a very good understanding of administrative law, and, and in my experience, neither the leaders of the FTC nor the members of the FTC bar tend to have a real good understanding of administrative law. So I want to start by uh, just giving an administrative law perspective on what we're talking about. For, and, and the starting point here is th there are three kinds of rules. Uh, uh, there are policy statements, there are interpretative rules, and then there are substantive rules. Uh, and um, what prior speakers have referred to as guidances are uh, some combination of interpretative rules and policy statements. Okay, an interpretative rule is just a rule that, that announces the agency's interpretation of a statute it administers, and a uh, policy statement is just a statement of the policies that the uh, agency intends to try to further in its implementation of the statutes that it, it implements. Uh, and um, those kinds of rules have one big disadvantage that I'll turn back to in a moment, uh, they are not legally binding, okay? Uh, but they have some enormous advantages. First, they can be issued relatively quickly. Uh, you need to provide an explanation for why you've done what you have done, and, but you don't, uh, there, there's no prescribed procedure, uh, so it's, it's not the, the very long, uh, 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 resource-intensive process that's involved in issuing a substantive rule. Now, the other disadvantage, however, of, of, of uh, uh, and policy statements and, and uh, interpretative rules or guidance documents, if you prefer that, that uh, uh, language, is uh, they're incredibly easy for the next administration to change. And uh, we, in this age of extreme political polarity, you can be quite sure that uh, uh, just as the, the, the current uh, FTC uh, in the first uh, two weeks of uh, uh, Chair Khan's uh, 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 running of the agency uh, uh, eliminated a whole lot of the prior uh, uh, guidance documents. Uh, um, you, if we have next a Republican president, there's a good chance that all the the uh, high proportion of the, the, the uh, guidance documents or interpretative rules and policy statements that are issued in, in this administration will uh, turn out to have quite short lives. Uh, uh, policy statements and interpretative rules or guidance documents can be extremely valuable, and, and the FTC has used them to great effect uh, if they are coupled with strategically chosen 
in judications. If you say, okay, our, our interpretation of the statute is this conduct is illegal, and uh, our policy is we want to eliminate this conduct, uh, uh, then uh, people can ignore those, those non-legally binding statements unless and until you bring a couple of successful enforcement actions and, and uh, hurt some firms that have engaged in that, that practice. But if you couple the guidance documents with strategically chosen adjudications, they can be very effective. Now that's completely different from substantive rules in many respects. Substantive rules uh, cannot be issued except through use of the notice and comment process. The notice and comment process takes an average of somewhere between two and five years to complete in any given case and is extremely resource intensive. The big advantage it has is it's, it's a, it creates a legally binding rule of conduct. Uh, so it, it, that, that's a big advantage. Another big advantage is uh, it, it, it's more sticky in the sense that the next administration really would have to work very hard and long to change it, uh, but uh, the disadvantages are takes a lot of resources, takes a lot of time. Uh, uh, other characteristics, and, and I don't call them either advantages or disadvantages. I actually think of them as as advantages, but they're uh, <laughs> the, the the current chair might experience them as disadvantages. They, these are are taken very seriously by reviewing courts, and re reviewing courts want to see solid empirical support for any rule you issue using the notice and comment process. So you, you got to follow the, the very demanding, lengthy, burdensome procedures, and at the end of the day, you better have lots of empirical support for whatever you say. Uh, uh, but it, you know, if you can do that, uh, that, that's great. Now, one other characteristic that I know we're going to be spending a lot of time on is, uh, well, while interpretative rules and policies, you don't have to point to some provision in the statute to support your power to issue uh, an interpretative rule or a policy statement. All agencies have that inherent power. It would be stupid to have an agency that, that, that didn't have the power to, to announce publicly how it interprets the statutes it's implementing or what policies it, it plans to pursue in implementing those statutes. But when it comes to substantive rulemaking, uh, you better have solid statutory authority uh, to, to do it or, or, or you can't do it. Uh, now there's one other form of rulemaking uh, that, that actually Howard uh, 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 discussed in his introductory speech today, uh, that is the notice and comment rulemaking as it was tremendously expanded by Congress in two amendments to the FTC Act in 1975 and 1980, and that creates a procedure that is so burdensome uh, that uh, it, it, it takes six to eight years uh, uh, to, to uh, complete a single rulemaking on average, uh, and uh, uh, just a tremendous amount of, of, of resources. It, it's clear that uh, FTC has the power to use that extremely demanding form of uh, rulemaking to create substantive rules to implement the part of the act that uh, makes it unlawful to engage in unfair uh, or deceptive acts or practices. It is not at all clear that they uh, have the power, well, what, what Chair Khan says, argues, is that they have the power to use not that very demanding form of rulemaking, but the straight notice and comment version to determine uh, and define um, the uh, unfair competition uh, uh, practices, uh, and, and that is highly doubtful, I'd, I'd say, is the best way to put it. Uh, she's relying on the combination of a DC Circuit opinion issued in 1973 using a method of statutory interpretation that no current member of the Supreme Court would, would, would find uh, 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 acceptable, uh, and uh, then a very strangely worded uh, uh, 
a uh, few words in the 1975 amendment to the FTC Act. And I, I, I wouldn't say she has no chance of prevailing on that, but I think she has very little chance. The FTC has very little chance of prevailing on that. Uh, but with that uh, introduction, I think I'll turn back to people who actually have served at the agency in responsible positions and can provide a, a, a lot more meat on the bones of that uh, uh, just generalization. Uh, thank you so much, Dick. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, portrayal of the different types of rules. And of course, these uh, policy statement and interpretative rules are uh, easier to adopt and, and give more freedom. And these very demanding substantive rules uh, is, is it's what we're talking about here uh, as the FTC, uh, this kind of legal authority to enact substantial rules when it comes to unfair methods sort of competition. And uh, you're, you're, you're skeptical about that. Uh, but the thing is, we, we were here before. In the past, in the history, uh, there was already some kind of adoptions of substantive rules and Congress reacted to that. So uh, Maureen, can you just tell us a bit of the, this congressional reactions in the past of FTC's attempt to uh, adopt substantive rules when it comes to unfair methods of competition. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. thank you. Ha happy to talk about mm. that. So when the FTC adopted what became known as the Octane Rule, uh, it adopted as both an unfair method of competition and an unfair and deceptive act of practice. Um, and then that was challenged in the DC Circuit and led to the, the case that, that Dick referred to uh, that where the court upheld its authority, though did very little to parse through whether it was an unfair method of competition or an unfair deceptive act or practice. And one of the things to keep in mind uh, when we're talking about rulemaking, uh, the FTC has this incredibly generic statute, unfair deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. It was so easy to be a commissioner because I could recite my you know, basic statutory authority because it fits on the back, you know, of a, in a, it fits in a tweet, right? It's so brief compared to a lot of other highly detailed statutes where agencies undertake rulemaking based on very clear direction from Congress about what they're supposed to be doing. So uh, in response to uh, the petroleum marketers case uh, on the octane rule, Congress, two years later, enacted the Magnuson-Moss Act, uh, which imposed very detailed rulemaking procedures for the FTC to engage in unfair and deceptive, so just the consumer protection type of rulemaking. It put statutory, additional statutory requirements in, notice requirements in, hearing requirements in, and also gave the FTC the ability to enforce the rules, because that's another thing that's kind of missing from the, this general authority in the FTC Act. Uh, it, it's not clear that the Act, under the previous authority, actually gave the FTC the ability to enforce or impose any remedy for a violation of the rule. So Congress stepped in with Mag Moss uh, and put all these highly detailed guardrails in place for the FTC. The FTC then went on a rulemaking spree um, I wasn't here for this morning, but I, I wonder if that's what <laughs> Howard may, may have talked about. And then they ended up with even more requirements on it and uh, a definition of unfairness for the first time. Um, kind of putting that all to one side, uh, because the real debate going on these days is what happened to that unfair methods of competition authority that seemed that the court supported and that Congress in enacting Mag Moss essentially was silent on, said this doesn't affect any authority the FTC may have for unfair methods of competition rulemaking. It doesn't say the authority, it says any authority. And I think that sort of agnosticism is important because Mag Moss is not the source of UMC rulemaking authority. You'd have to go back to the FTC's organic statute, and as Dick already suggested, Statutory interpretation today um, in the federal courts would be highly unlikely to find that very broad source of rulemaking authority. Essentially, the DC Circuit said, we like rulemaking, we think it's a good idea, we think it carries all these benefits, maybe some of the benefits that Marina touched on, um, and the statute doesn't say you can't do it. So essentially, you can do it. And we, you know, the AMG decision uh, uh, that the 
Supreme Court uh, recently uh, issued is just one example of how statutory interpretation has changed. So I, I don't think there is a source of UMC authority in the FTC Act or in the Mag Moss Act. But one of the things that I explored and with my co-author Ben Rawson, who's a colleague of mine at Baker Botts, that's in the volume is, well, whatever happened to the octane rule? Right? Where, where did that go? Right? That was, the, that was the, the thing that was being discussed in this case. So we actually went back and looked at the history of that. Um, so Congress uh, decided to adopt the octane rule um, through a statute, the Petroleum Marketing Act, I think it's called. I'm not sure I have it quite. I have my little <laughs> small reading glasses on. But um, so what happened was. Um, the Petroleum Marketing Practices Act, that's, that's the name of it. Um, so Congress um, adopted that as, as a law. And it gave the FTC rulemaking authority, but it only adopted it as, as an unfair or deceptive rule and gave the FTC not just straight up easy peasy notice and comment rulemaking, put additional guardrails in place. The FTC asked for unfair methods of competition authority f under that act, and Congress did not give it to it. So I think putting all of those pieces together to suggest that out of a, you know, a decision that would not be you know, on very firm ground today, subsequent congressional reaction to put lots of guardrails in place for a broad authority uh, for unfair and deceptive acts or practices to say nothing in that statute on UMC for the exact rule that was at issue to make it just an unfair and deceptive acts or practices rule and deny UMC rulemaking authority and put additional, even put additional guardrails in place. And then one other source that I want to talk about is the FTC has rulemaking authority under some other statutes, uh, typically consumer protection statutes, where it has the more streamlined notice and comment rulemaking, things like the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. But those go back to statutes. They're not coming from the general FTC uh, source of authority, but it's where Congress has made a much more detailed regulatory scheme, and the FTC then is implementing that scheme. And so it engages in notice and comment rulemaking because it's essentially filling in the details. Congress has made the hard decisions. Congress has said, here's where you know, the boundaries are. It's you know, children's online privacy protection. Age 13 is the, is the dividing line. Uh, it covers this type of data. Here are the obligations that are required. It's not this kind of very open-ended um, authority that you see in the FTC Act. So I think when you put all those pieces together, it's a very, very difficult argument to say that somehow out of all of this emerges the ability for the FTC to engage in unfair methods of competition rulemaking authority using simply notice and comment, um, or really any, uh, any unfair methods of competition rulemaking. And that's also putting to the side the questions of if it is this very broad authority which has been interpreted as to essentially be coterminous with the Sherman Act, what does that mean for an, um, a, a system where we have dual antitrust enforcement uh, and the DOJ has no similar power? So I'll, I'll stop there, but uh, <laughs> I think that's been, I think that's kind of sums up the congressional yeah. reaction. Thank you so much, uh, Maureen. That's a very clear explanation of um, perhaps the lack of legal authority as Section 6G is very opaque and vague. And as you said, Congress refused or at least denied to act and recognize uh, rulemaking authority when it comes to unfair methods of competition and put guardrails uh, for um, consumer protection. Uh, rulemaking. Precisely moving on consumer protection aspect, uh, I think uh, it would be great, Alden, if you can walk us through uh, this idea of perhaps using Section 18 and MAGMOS uh, procedure in order to do unfair method of competition rulemaking of, of some sort. Uh, can you just tell us about these potential limitations or uh, institutional uh, constraints that uh, the current FTC chair may potentially face? Uh, well, thanks, uh, Aurelien. I'm glad to do it. I would just add, before starting, I certainly agree with uh, uh, Maureen Olhausen's commentary on 
6G authority, I have more, I, she has written about that with, with Jim Rail. I've written an article which is in the book collection. So let's proceed under the assumption, which is my strong <laughs> assumption, that if it ever got to the Supreme Court, I think it's almost certain the Supreme Court would hold the FTC does not have substantive 6G authority. But again, let's look at section 18, which, uh, what does it say specifically? And you know, Howard Beals discussed it a bit, but uh, it says the FTC has authority to quote, to prescribe rules which define with specificity acts or practices which are unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. It requires the FTC rulemaking proceedings provide an opportunity for informal hearings at which interested parties are accorded limited rights of cross-examination. And again, before comment, uh, commencing a Section 18 rulemaking, the FTC must have reason to believe that the practices to be addressed by the rulemaking are, quote, prevalent, close quote. And that's a statutory requirement. Now, uh, the FTC uh, policy statement on dissent, deception, which was issued in 1983, I don't think is really relevant to competition issues. It says the FTC will find deception uh, if there is a representation, omission, or practice that is likely to mislead the consumer acting reasonably in the circumstances to the consumer's detriment. Unfair, now, unfairness is a better fit. Here you're saying that really misleading the consumer you, one could, maybe could come up with scenarios that basically it doesn't seem like the sort of thing that would really fit uh, uh, unfair methods of competition, harms to the competitive process in general. So unfairness would be a better fit. So the unfairness wing. What about unfairness? Section 5N of the FTC Act, uh, which was uh, promulgated in the late 1980s, states that to be unfair, an act or practice must be likely to cause substantial injury, which is not reasonably available, avoidable, pardon me, avoidable by consumers themselves and not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or to competition. In practice, this is the cost-benefit test. You have to say not only is there substantial harm, but it's not outweighed by countervailing benefits, and uh, that's not easy. You have to do a cost-benefit analysis, like it or not. So uh, there were, uh, steps in 1980 added to my, Mag Magnus and Moss, uh, you know, to extreme, uh, to sort of deal with issues uh, raised by some of the rulemakings of the FTC in the, in the late 1970s. Now, the FTC voted three to two in July 2021, and, and uh, this was referred to earlier, to quote unquote streamline the Magnuson Moss process, remove quote decades of self-imposed red tape, and allow FTC to issue timely rules on a wide variety of issues, particularly privacy. But there were two dissenters uh, who warned that this might suggest stacking the deck and uh, a lack, certain lack of due process. And when two of the five commissioners write this, you can be sure that reviewing judges if they're concerned uh, about how, how a uh, rulemaking was conducted, are going to be very attentive. So I think that should be a warning. You'd have to, the FTC, like it or not, is going to be a very careful not to cut procedural uh, corners. Now, the key steps in Section 18, again, it is lengthy, although uh, it, it can be done. There's a publication of a, of a uh, advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, which has to include possible regulatory alternatives. There's a notice, notice of public uh, rulemaking for comments with a text of the rule, justifications, alternatives, a preliminary regulatory cost benefit analysis, and reason to believe practices are prevalent. Three, any interested person may seek in, uh, informal hearings with rebuttal and cross-examination. Cross FTC publishes then the final rule with statement of basis and pur purpose, prevalence, practices, uh, and it ha the economic effect, which gets back to this uh, cost-benefit analysis. And any person may seek DC Circuit review in addition to traditional Administrative Procedure Act grounds. Uh, the court may direct the FTC to consider more submissions set aside rule, a rule based on 
uh, uh, lack of substantial evidence and set aside a rule if the FTC's rebuttal or cross-examination precluded disclosure of material facts. And in, uh, now, in enforcing the rule, uh, they, the FTC may seek penalties over $46,000 per violation and or consumer redress in district court, but the FTC must show the defendant violated a rule with actual knowledge or knowledge fairly implied. So these are tough hurdles because they offer up a number of ways in which uh, critics of the rule uh, could try to get an appeals court say, look, you didn't follow through, uh, there's lack of substantial evidence, or there's lack of uh, cost-benefit analysis, et cetera. Uh, Jessica Rich, who's a former senior official in the Bureau of Consumer Protection now in private practice, admittedly has said this is a long and rocky road, especially for complex rules with many mandates and for controversial ma matters. Uh, now, the F now as again, getting back to this Section 5N cost-benefit analysis, so the FTC would have to show actual consumer injury stemming from a condemned type of conduct plus explore plausible claims advanced of countervailing benefits, and you can bet that the uh, parties would ra raise such claims to consumers or co competitive process, and it would have to demonstrate convincingly, con convincingly again the conduct's benefits were less weighty than uh, the harms. And so I think all of this is, makes it very tough to win on appeal. Not impossible, but tough. And also, there's also the possibility, the court might say, well, wait a second. If this is really an anti-competitive practice you're looking at, we, we can stew the term unfair uh, or, uh, or deceptive acts or practices. Even if you're talking about unfairness, this really applies to consumer protection issues, not competition issues. So that's another risk, I think, would be, m might arise on appeal. And I mentioned the due process risk based on what the FTC did a year ago. Uh, so taken together, these factors suggest, yes, the FTC could promulgate, I think, an unfairness rule if it was very careful, jumped through all the hoops, made good findings, and so forth. And I'll make, but it would be very hard. Mm -hmm. And I am going to address one possible such rule later on. All right. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, so this was a very uh, detailed uh, account on Section 18. And so what we understand is that perhaps the, 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 the case, the, the legal case for um, UMC rulemaking uh, under Section 6 is pretty weak, as Maureen uh, described. And under Section 18, uh, it's very, as you say, long and rocky road, like uncertain and quite weak, too. Uh, nevertheless, let's assume, I mean, if you look at the uh, regulatory priority agenda issued by the FTC in November 2021, clearly rulemaking authority and, and is, is at the top of the priority. So the current leadership wants to do rulemaking, irrespective perhaps of the legal uh, discussions that we, had, uh, we, we just had. Marina, uh, given this institutional constraint that we, we, just, uh, we just touched upon uh, and the, the willingness of the current leadership to, um, to engage in rulemaking, what would be the best use or the good use of rulemaking authority under UMC, um, more specifically when it comes to, for example, blanket prohibitions? Uh, should it be rulemaking for uh, blanket prohibitions or should it be rulemaking for, let's say, presumptions or uh, burden shifting as we discussed in the previous uh, panel? What's your take on the, the okay. content on the rulemaking, let's okay. say? Um since I'm the only person on the panel who believes <laughs> that there's 6G authority, I hope you will give me half a minute <laughs> sure, to, sure, to, sure. to try to make my best case as yeah. to why I think there's a 6G authority, even though it may be a little bit tenuous. I think, uh, first of all, uh, when the uh, legislative history is unclear, is vague, mm -hmm. you look at the plain language, right? So if you look at 6G, the plain language of 6G expressly authorizes the FTC to make rules and regulations for the purpose of carrying out Section 5 and then other listed provisions of the Act. Notably, there's no limitation in the language uh, restricting it to procedural rules. And I did not do a exhaustive research, but I happen to know of at least one statute, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, and at least one agency, uh, the EEOC, 
where Congress wanted to limit the agency's rulemaking authority to procedural regulations uh, only. And it knew to do that. It knew to spell it out. So in this case, it obviously did not spell it out in 6G. And given the ambiguity, um, I would say that uh, yeah. maybe it's tenuous, but you could make a case that there is uh, authority. Okay. Now, um, uh, I, I won't go into a long discussion of national uh, petroleum because we've already talked about that. Uh, I would say that it's defensible. Um, on uh, Mac Moss, I, my uh, take on it uh, differs a little bit from Maureen's. So uh, Congress had passed Mac Moss uh, in reaction to national petroleum. National Petroleum said that there was rulemaking authority, substantive and procedural. Uh, Mac Moss then heightened the procedural requirements for uh, the consumer protection aspect, uh, UDAP rulemaking. But then it specifically said, uh, it is true in one short sentence, that the section did not reach UMC rulemaking. So the way I read it, and I think it is a reasonable way to read it, is that that means that National Petroleum's holding with respect to UMC stands, that it remains intact, right? Because you have a, a statute that was responding to the case and it responded to one of it and it said that we will heighten the procedural requirements for uh, consumer protection rulemaking, but it's not going to apply to UMC. So the way I read it is that the case holds, that the case remains intact with respect to what Matt Moss did not alter. And so the commission uh, does have notice and comment uh, UMC rulemaking under Section G. So I had to get that in. Yeah. Now I'll go back to the question that uh, you had asked. I think a lot of the criticism um, about the FTC's potential use of rulemaking seems to anticipate that the commission is going to issue across the board uh, per se rules for conduct to which courts currently apply the rule of reason. Now, if that is indeed what the FTC leadership is envisioning, then I would agree that it would be problematic. Uh, and those rules would probably be, uh, would not survive judicial review. But rulemaking isn't confined to issuing per se rules, which is the question you had asked. It can involve uh, establishing uh, presumptions of illegality for certain conduct and then setting the conditions and setting the uh, setting forth the conditions of the criteria, which if they are met or if they exist, would then trigger the presumption. So this would uh, effectively um, operationalize, I, I think as I said earlier, the rule of reason and make it more uh, workable, make it manageable, make it administrable, and yet at the same time uh, would not invoke the per se rule. Mm -hmm. And it would also allow the defendant to then rebut the presumption in the uh, shortened and the abbreviated adjudication. So I'm going to use one example, and that's the pay for delay uh, example, the pay for delay instances. As probably uh, all of you know, the Supreme Court uh, in activists held that the rule of reason, not the per se rule, would apply to reverse settlement agreements. Now given that, uh, the FTC can't just issue a rule declaring reverse settlement agreements to be per se unlawful, uh, no matter how wrong they think the decision was, right? I, I don't think that can be done. But what the, what, what the agency could do is to pass a rule to structure the rule of reason in a way that makes enforcement possible uh, that, and to make it more efficient. Uh, the commission, it so happens, has had a lot of experience with uh, reverse settlement agreements. And they have actually accumulated a lot of data and a lot of empirical uh, evidence as well. So it's really well situated to know under what circumstances a reverse settlement uh, is most likely to be an improper agreement to pay for delayed entry, uh, no matter how that agreement is disguised as something legitimate, because it has the data, it has the expertise. So if that's the case, then what the rule can do is to set forth the conditions. If you see this, if you see this, if you see that, then if all these conditions are satisfied, if you see the existence of these conditions, then it's going to trigger a rebuttable presumption that the agreement is unlawful, that it's really a pay for delay agreement and not uh, to exchange for a bunch of uh, services and a bunch of 
products that the generic company is, is supposedly mm -hmm. paying the branding company for. So uh, I think that would be something that would be a very good use of uh, rulemaking. Um, it would involve an issue uh, that has a lot at stake, right? We're talking about a lot of money. A lot of uh, consumers would be hurt if you have pay for delay agreements. And it's an issue that's going to come up again and again. It's something that's very expensive to sue. Yes, the FTC won activists, but how is the government going to win many of these cases, given the amount of work that has to go in to tease out the deal, to show that the payment is really for delay and not for all these, excuse me, bogus reasons for supposedly uh, the payment, right? So, um, so, so I, I think um, that that just makes a nice case for rulemaking. Uh, but I think it's not even necessary for the agency to have actual experience and expertise. In that case, it happens to have. And so I think it's a very good fit. Um, even if uh, the government did not, even if the FTC did not have the expertise, if the stakes are high, and if the issue is going to happen over and over again, such as with uh, non-compete clauses, if, if, if that's the case, the agency can acquire expertise. It can take advantage of the various powers that it does have under 6B and other, uh, mostly 6B, I think. And then it can take advantage of all the powers that it does have, collect data, acquire new learning, acquire new economic learning, uh, evident, uh, get empirical evidence and so forth. And uh, that, that I think would be a good use. And I think I'll leave mm. it at that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that would be more evidentiary rules, right? Rules of evidence of how, what what is the standard of proof, and uh, that's what you, you you see as rulemaking on unfair methods of competition, right? Yeah. Uh, I rules of evidence of yeah. standard of proof. Yeah. Yes. Like rebuttal of. Uh, right. So uh, what I'm hoping for is that the uh, there will be enough um, evidence, enough data, mm. to allow the FTC to say that when you see this, when you see this, when right. you see this, then um, it is more likely than not mm. that there is an anti-competitive mm. effect. Right. And therefore, we're going to presume that. Mm -hmm. And in each particular case, the FTC right. would not have to go through a laborious process mm. of having experts testify why this particular practice would right. uh, in, uh, have a net anti-competitive right. effect. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, so that's one way way of looking at rules, but more specifically, uh, the, uh, the FTC has looked or at least envisaged more uh, um, rulemaking authority on specific topics. And one of the topics that is discussed and that is very important for every uh, worker perhaps here in America is the way you regulate or the way the FTC may intervene into an uh, employment contract and how to prohibit potentially non-compete clause. This is one of the very, uh, very important issue uh, that I think the FTC is very keen to embark on. Um, Alden, uh, what a kind of rulemaking uh, intervention for the FTC into non-compete clause would look like? Would it be desirable? Uh, and, and what would be the, the, the consequences or perhaps also the unintended consequences of such a, such a role on non-compete clause? Oh, yes. Uh, so thanks again, Aurélien. I think, uh, again, I'm not going to address Section 60. As I said earlier, I don't think that that would really uh, work well. And obviously, the special statutes, which prescribes particular types of rules and rulemaking, rule such as on uh, children's online privacy, they're inapplicable. So again, we're back to Section 18. Now, uh, non-compete agreements have been used in a wide variety of employment contracts throughout history in the U.S., their legal status has been governed by state laws that differ in approach from total prohibition to case-by-case -case evaluation of reasonableness. And indeed, in recent years, I think a number of states have uh, more and more adopted a tough approach, close to uh, per se illeg illegality, so to speak, for, towards non-competes, but not all have. Now, there's a solid federalism argument to allow continued competition and experimentation among the states in this area. And uh, the, F the FTC at times has wanted to say it has preemptive uh, authority, rulemaking authority, that's up to, up subject to some doubt. But setting that aside, uh, 
uh, there's a countervailing argument that labor mobility supports a national rule. Now, federal legislation to establish such a rule is certainly a possibility, but it could be hard to pass given concerns that non-competes may serve a valuable economic purpose in many cases, and I'll touch upon that in a moment. Now, an FTC rule is an alternative uh, possibility. The 2021 President Biden executive order on competition in effect sort of directs the FTC to consider promulgating such a rule. Now, could it succeed uh, I'd, uh, under a, Section 18? So consider a Section 18 rule that forbade certain types of non-compete agreements under which, again, an employer requires that the employee agree not to seek future employment with a competitor as unfair acts. So the FTC would be required, again, under unfairness, uh, Section 5N, uh, to account for the benefits of non-compete clauses for consumers and a competitive process, which include reduced cost or better quality for companies, uh, ability to uh, invest in uh, uh, training and with knowledge that they'll be able to count on that training, for example, for time, over time. Now, although some evidence shows that wages are lower with the presence of non-compete agreements, uh, this evidence is not universal, and there may well be company-level pro-competitive and pro-consumer benefits stemming from non-compete agreements that outweigh the effect of lower wages. Now, the benefits may involve, for example, protection of trade secrets, investments by company in human capital, concerns about free riding on specialized training of employees. So one might say, OK, uh, why not look at a very narrow uh, non-compete clause directed just to minimum wage employees, say, in, uh, there, the argument would be, it's very, it may be much harder to conjure up true efficiency, so they may seem pretextual. So I think certainly if it wanted to act uh, initially, the FTC would probably be on stronger ground in terms of cost-benefit analysis in just considering focusing on such sort of minimum wage employees. Now, although a broad non-compete rule, a broader one, I think, applying to all companies, uh, including highly specialized workers, would probably fail on cost-benefit grounds. Uh, uh, there also may be, even f for broader non-competes, a targeted rule that could pass muster, uh, not certain but possible, which would require an, employee to no an employer to notify its employees of a non-compete agreement before they accept a job. Now, uh, why would that pass muster? Uh, so it's a, that's a situation an economist call one of asymmetric information. Uh, typically, many consumers might not have seen the, the small print. There could be substantial injury to the consumer, reasonableness of avoidance of harm by the, unreasonableness of avoidance of harm by the consumer, uh, and possible benefits for the consumer competition if they're aware. So substantial injury. Uh, when an employee is asked to sign non-compete agreement is notified about the existence of the agreement only after accepting a job, uh, individual isn't able to assess the economic reality of the employment situation with all available information. Uh, avoidance of harm when a non-compete is presented after employment has begun and as a condition of continued employment, new employees face a substantial loss of bargaining power compared to their pre-employment situation they have to choose between their pre-negotiated salary and benefits uh, as compared to the reasonable expectations they had, or unemployment. So at this point, many employees may be unable to negotiate a salary increase. They lost this, this bargaining uh, power p potentially. Now, the benefits to consumers as employees uh, or to competition, again, uh, there's some evidence that lower wages and worse wage outcomes uh, over when you, there's increased training, strangely enough, over time for workers who are bound by non-competes and a small amount of evidence that non-competes may have a chilling effect on competition for workers. So uh, I think a defense of a rule then uh, would be one uh, that for non-compete agreement to be fair, uh, the employer must offer the non-compete agreement before when the employment contract is signed. And one example might be a statute passed in Massachusetts in 2018 
uh, which provides that, that the non-compete must be provided to the employee the earlier of a formal offer of employment or 10 days before employment starts. Again, as we've seen, this is a tough, uh, Section 18 is a tough road to follow, but if, if the FTC, again, wanted to look at non-competes, I think they should look at the easiest thing to do would be look at requiring offers that, uh, that the existence of non-compete non, non be made uh, before the uh, job is entered into uh, and to give the employee al alternatives. And again, possibly uh, uh, non-competes uh, apply, apply to minimum wage workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Alden. That's a, a very uh, important uh, topic. I'm sure we're going to discuss that uh, this issue of non-competes uh, throughout the, the year. Uh, there's also a federal questions of whether the federal government should intervene in something that is nowadays regulated by states. Uh, another aspect um, that is perhaps subject to uh, rulemaking authority by the current uh, FTC leadership is the way uh, companies can exclude and have exclusionary conduct vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, third party uh, business sellers and, and, and other uh, trading partners. Uh, and so this idea of rulemaking on exclusionary contract is is developing. I mean, we've seen some uh, petition that uh, I think was last year. Uh, Maureen, how will a rulemaking on exclusionary contract would look like? Is it desirable? Uh, what would it mean in terms of um, regulating uh, ex-ante this type of ex exclusionary contract as opposed to nowadays like exposed through the court system? Well, this is an area where there is already a very well-developed body of case law under traditional antitrust law. And the at least the petition from Open Markets Institute, which, as you will recall, was where Chair Khan came from before she came to the FTC. Well, at least she worked there a while before working in Congress, um, has this petition to, for the FTC to engage in rulemaking, which Chair Khan has highlighted and asked for comments on. Um, so it seems that it has at least some, some level of interest at, at the FTC. And it advocates to have rules in place that depart quite substantially from that well-developed body of case law. So um, it would require or suggest um, that um, there should be per se illegality for any exclusivity requirements that result in a finding of substantial foreclosure. Um, and then the test it puts forward for substantial foreclosure is whether a defendant has 30% or higher market share and uses exclusivity with all of its customers, suppliers, or distributors of an essential input. Uh, or it results in a 30% or more of the market foreclosed to rivals, or it results in three, uh, the largest three or more customers, distributors, or suppliers being foreclosed to rivals. So it deems that, it talks about the dominance test, quantitative, and then qualitative foreclosure. Um, so these level of market shares are well below mm -hmm. what uh, case law has determined for um, finding um, you know, concerns about um, exclusivity or mar market dominance. So 30% would be on the very low side. Um, and um, uh, one of the uh, most important things about this also is it makes it a per se rule, right? So unlike uh, the case law, which is a rule of reason approach, uh, an entity charged under a rule as at least um, encouraged by the open markets petition, uh, wouldn't be able to put forth um, actual effects, mm -hmm. right? Does, does, this, does this actually do something bad? Or pro-competitive benefits, right? That it actually, you know, we know a lot about, uh, you know, some of the economics here. It's not that it's always good. Like I supported the McWayne case. Um, there was no, you know, evidence of pro-competitive benefit there. But often, what the case law has recognized is that this can sharpen competition, this can be pro-competitive. So, um, so that petition is pending before the FTC, and if a rule were to be pursued along those lines, it would, again, divert quite substantially from the case law. And then interestingly, because I, I also mentioned this, 
for industries that are not regulated by the FTC. So the FTC has carve-outs to its authority. It has no authority over common carriers, right? And that's, that's kind of a large, a large bucket, um, but we'll, we'll put that there. They would not be subject to such rules because the FTC couldn't reach them. So you would end up also with this very odd situation where some entities, it would be per se illegal, and for other entities, uh, exactly the same type of behavior would be treated under the rule of reason. And you can imagine, you know, the FTC and DOJ share any trust oversight. So whether your behavior or even your merger, depending on, you know, what, how they're going to do these reviews, where, which agency it gets clear to could actually affect liability. Right, which is not the situation that we have today, where you have two agencies, they may divide up based on who has authority over what industry or expertise in a particular industry, but they're applying the same standard of liability. Mm. So with a rule like that, you would end up in a very different type of area that I think raises some real concerns about having that dual review system that we have. Right. Yeah, the, definitely it's um, per se illegality on uh, exclusionary contract, when you have 30% of market share, this reminds me of uh, a kind of abuse of dominant position, uh, which is uh, uh, the European uh, corruption law. And, and it's also what Chair Khan has advocated in the House report, when she, um, uh, I mean, not only her, but others advocated for a kind of abuse of dominant position in the US uh, for a Europeanization of antitrust, uh, where you will have more aggressive enforcement. Uh, so that would be a very radical shift uh, and some departure also from the DOJ, as you just, as you just uh, mentioned. Um, I mean, having heard all that, this potential very ambitious agenda and very potential, uh, potentially aggressive or at least uh, ambitious agenda on, on rulemaking, uh, uh, Dick, what, I mean, in terms of the reaction to the court and in terms of uh, the potential assessment of this uh, rulemaking agenda, in the months and years to come. Uh, what, is your, what is your analysis of that? How do you see that faring in the midterm or, or long term? Thanks. Uh, let me just begin with a very brief response to Marina's uh, um, case in support of the existence of the, the rulemaking power. Uh, the, uh, I, I think she made the strongest possible case and, and, and made, uh, made it very well. And, if I were representing the FTC, I would have no problem at all uh, going before the, the U.S. Supreme Court and making exactly that argument with a straight face. However, I would have cautioned my boss, the chair, that uh, I thought we had only about a 30% chance of success because I, I, I just uh, wrote up uh, uh, the, the two most recent administrative law uh, decisions that the, the U.S. Supreme Court issued last week. Uh, and uh, uh, in both cases, all, all nine justices placed a tremendous amount of emphasis on context and consistency. And both of those are big weaknesses uh, that, that uh, can be uh, pointed out, uh, would be pointed out by opposing counsel uh, uh, in response to Marina's argument. But let, let's assume that, that uh, FTC prevails, and I'm not saying they can't prevail. There's a chance they'll prevail on that. Uh, I, when I read uh, Chair Khan's writings, uh, I, I see that what she wants to do with rulemaking is she makes it very clear she wants to change antitrust law, and she's gone into quite detail in, in, in criticizing a lot of the Supreme Court's opinions in the area of antitrust law. So she apparently believes that, assuming she has this power, that the, FD, the agency has this power, the agency can use it to say, okay, the Supreme Court said X about this practice. We say not X, and we win, because we did it by rulemaking. And th that has zero chance, absolutely zero chance of prevailing in the Supreme Court. Uh, the fact that this statute is worded a little bit differently from the Clayton Act or the Sherman Act, uh, or, or they use rulemaking rather than ju the justices aren't going to pay any attention to that. If the, she just the, the agency goes up there and says, "You're wrong," and uh, we're right. Now accept our position. They lose every time. Uh, that's nine nothing losses. 
Now, I, and I make that point in, in, in the piece, my contribution to the, the book in a few contexts. But Marina's uh, uh, discussion of, of a potential reverse payments rule uh, it is a really intriguing uh, illustration of something that could work if, if FTC has this power. It, it, Justice Breyer's opinion for the majority in Octavus says, okay, we're not going to accept, I don't accept the uh, uh, position of the FTC uh, that there should be a presumption of illegality in, in, uh, with respect to um, uh, reverse payment settlements. But uh, uh, what I see is rule of reason, and I don't think rule of reason is going to take very long to address because it's pretty easy to address in this. What we now know, and FTC certainly knows, based on painful experiences in the post octavus period, that we're now talking about 10 to 15 years to, 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 to uh, apply rule of reason. And, and the result in many cases after 10 or 15 years is, yeah, it was nothing but a thinly disguised agreement to create a monopoly and share a monopoly profits. But in the meantime, there's been 10 or 15 years that that, that deal has. So I could imagine if it's real well, cleverly worded uh, to, to uh, uh, pick up on the language of the majority opinion in Octavus rather than saying the court was wrong, saying oh, the court was right, but now we have some pretty solid evidence that it needs to be structured in order to, uh, I, can see, I can see that potentially uh, having uh, convincing the, the, the court. I, I, one other point there though, that was the opinion of Justice Breyer on, on behalf of uh, uh, five justices who are not there anymore. Uh, and, and there were four justices who, who wrote a, a dissenting opinion saying, no, absolutely not. There's a presumption of legality. And, and frankly, uh, the, there are now six justices who share the general philosophy of the four justices who said, no, no possibility. So there again, I, I give only a eh, fighting chance of uh, that uh, surviving judicial review. Could, could I just sure. add one point on that? Um, so I think the FTC really missed a great opportunity post, and I happen to say activist, so who knows how it's really said. There must be a real name somewhere that's a you know, source of truth, exactly how it's said. But um, it, the FTC did not pursue enforcement cases in its Part 3 authority after it won that big victory because it wanted to pursue money through uh, its 13B authority. And we saw what happened with that eventually in the AMG case. Um, so I, my um, speech that was cited in the AMG case called Do Dollars, Doctrine, and Damage Control, how the FTC pursuit of disgorgement affected its antitrust um, uh, mission, uh, I think it was a huge missed opportunity. It had it brought these cases in part three, it could have done the things that, Marina, I think you're absolutely right. It could have established a much more clarity about what is a payment, what are the, mm. you know, indicia of it being, you know, a sham kind of payment. Um, so, you know, kind of seeing all these things interrelated, I tend to see this as an example of where FTC overreach um, and desire to do something that the statute and Congress hadn't really gave them the ability to do made the agency actually much worse off mm. and consumers worse off and kind of set back the ability of the FTC to achieve things. And opportunity cost is an enormously important factor that engaging in a lot of rulemaking, um, I think, gets over, overlooked. The opportunity cost of using the tools that the agency clearly has to address issues. Yeah. Alden? Well, just to add uh, to what uh, Maureen said, I think, again, one of the problems, and I mean, justices may implicitly have realized it, that you, trying to get uh, 13B uh, consumer redress, there was a strong argument for it in a case of clear fraud, if you can, much easier case to measure where we uh, seller promises X, doesn't deliver it. Uh, it, it Maybe not be perfect, but that's something you can measure. That was really the sort of situation that, that arose in the AMG case, but even there they lost. But the, pro the problem with these competition cases is even 
if there's an illegal re reverse payment, the ability to measure with accuracy uh, uh, consumer loss or uh, quote or uh, excess profits is very difficult. And I think there had been this, this principle that uh, the FTC had accepted before that you should have a very clear understanding that you should e readily be able with a high degree of accuracy to measure the loss, which means that I think that former Chairman Muris argued that, yeah, the FTC should have stuck if it had stuck just to clear cases of fraud and so on, but it uh, didn't ex escape some people's notice that it tried, as Maureen said, to, to go beyond that and, and beyond the real capacity of accurate economic measurement. Right. Um, so before moving to Q&A, uh, I would ask each of the panelists to perhaps give final comments on what you've heard from other panelists and more uh, perhaps ambitiously, given what we've had as a, as a discussion on the legal, on the doubt about the legal authority of the FTC rulemaking authority on UMC, what would be your advice uh, to Chair Khan uh, since the current leadership definitely wants to engage in UMC uh, rulemaking? What would be your advice if, uh, if you have to advise her and the, and, and the leadership on what to do with when it comes to rulemaking authority? Perhaps I can start with Dick. Yep. Well, my first advice would be to rely on uh, what uh, the FTC knows it can do in, in, in the sense of, of uh, the tools that it has traditionally used to considerably good effect. Uh, 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 the, the combination of interpretative rules right. and policy statements and, and then strategically chosen uh, uh, pro ex enforcement actions, I, I, mm -hmm. I think, can get them a very long way. And I don't really see a lot to be gained from taking the chance of trying mm -hmm. to persuade the Supreme Court that, that it has uh, uh, notice and comment uh, uh, right. uh, power. But, but uh, whatever else they do, whether they follow that advice or not, I, I'd urge them to uh, listen very carefully to the views of people like Marina and, and Andy uh, in, in the earlier panel, who uh, are, are very clear that there are problems in antitrust law today. There are very serious problems in antitrust law today, but then there are incremental ways of changing antitrust law that would improve it quite a bit, rather than just going, yeah straight into, uh, I, I hate everything that now exists, I'm now going to reverse it all. Uh, that, that, that approach can never work. Uh, 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 go for the incremental changes, and then uh, a, along with that, go for the kinds of changes where you've got very solid empirical support for what you want to do. Uh, really, uh, going back to Alden's uh, uh, point, I mean, you've got to have solid evidence in support of whatever change you want to make. So those are the three pieces of advice I'd right. give. So non-legally binding rules, enforcement actions, and incremental changes. Marina? Can I offer non-legal advice? <laughs> 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 I, I think maybe uh, one thing is uh, to not be so acrimonious on the commission. I think uh, if you want to uh, have a chance of having a rule or whatever it is uh, to be accepted by the court in review. It's better, even if it, if it can't be 5-0, it should at least be not acrimonious. And then uh, related to that is, um, I, I don't think it's necessary for the leadership to go all out and say, we want to abandon, scrap the consumer welfare paradigm. I don't think there's going to be a chance of that happening. But the consumer welfare paradigm is pretty elastic. It's really a term of art. Mm -hmm. So you can be in support of that and still push, push the boundaries a little mm -hmm. bit to consider more things. So this is not really legal yeah. So incremental changes as well. I, I right? guess it's incremental, incremental change. change. Yeah. Maureen? I already mentioned opportunity costs, and it, it seems that the FTC, the, the leadership at the FTC, is looking in these other directions uh, and away from case-by-case -case enforcement. We've already heard case-by-case -case enforcement numbers are way down. Right. Uh, but when you look back, the way the FTC has effectively changed antitrust law is through case-by-case -case enforcement. And the agency has a very good record in the Supreme Court. The activist case, 
uh, hospital mergers, you have Phoebe Putney, you have North Carolina Dental, on state boards, um, and, the, and the list goes on and on. Um, we mentioned the McWain case, which gets, you know, thank you for mentioning it, because it seems, because it didn't involve a tech company, nobody <laughs> wants to talk about it. Um, but what has worked in the past? The FTC has had a really good record, I think, of doing strong enforcement based on evidence when you think, you, you know, uh, both Marina and Dick and Alden mentioned having a good empirical basis. Think about how the FTC for hospital merger enforcement um, they had lost a bunch of cases. DOJ had lost cases. Tim Muris did a very good retrospective and created the basis for um, changing the court's minds on how this actually was anti-competitive. And the, that has paid enormous uh, dividends to the agencies and to antitrust and to consumers. So I think, um, you know, yes, it takes time and, you know, yeah. patience to do those kinds of things, um, but I think the FTC is really created to make that kind of change and, you know, look at what has worked in the past as a path forward. Right. So a save resource and a focus on enforcement actions. And this comes back to the the FTC being an aid to the uh, uh, Department of Justice Antitrust Division at the end of the day. Uh, Alden? Uh, I, not too much to add. Again, I agree. I think it shouldn't, FTC should uh, focus on enforcement actions. I, I also think that by reinstituting uh, respect for economics and the consumer welfare standard and perhaps issuing a new interpretive statement of the meaning of unfair methods of competition, uh, it could strengthen its hand because I think the FTC also it should be very careful in issuing new uh, uh, in, uh, interpretations such as new new uh, merger guidelines because I think if it does not, since the uh, courts for four decades have highlighted the importance of consumer welfare standard, which as Marina had said, it can be applied more broadly than many people think, the courts are not going to like it if the FTC seems to have abandoned economics and abandoned the consumer welfare standard. I think it really needs to get back to those things. Maybe bring one or two narrow uh, uh, Magnuson Moss rules, but if it doesn't get back to those things, I think it's really threatening uh, its, its ability to win in, in federal courts because uh, federal court judges will be not unaware of, of what's happened. Right. So be aware of the judicial backlash and uh, make sure that it's not counterproductive. So thank you so much for this uh, discussion. We're going to open it up to uh, Q&A. Uh, is there any? Yeah. Bilal. So this, this question really touches on something Marina said and I, I want to I wanna, uh, present an alternative to. First, the um, a proposed rule with respect to reverse payments uh, it, at least as you describe it, strikes me as uh, mimicking or would require mimicking of a rule of reason analysis in an adjudication. So I'm wondering what you get out of a rule <clears throat> that, that sounds well like, like you laid out. And then I'd contrast that with an alternative uh, area where I think the agency might actually think about a rule, uh, although they've, they've done something about this. And that's in the area of sort of state action. Right, either uh, uh, articulating what might be active supervision uh, in a in a rule-based structure. Right, it, it's hard for me to see the parties having um, an, uh, an efficiency justification, uh, in a sense, if you can think about it this way, you know, for failing for a you know the active supervision prong to be met, and I think it'd be useful. Uh, for the agency to articulate this uh, potentially more than they have. Uh, now, the agency has done that. We did that in, uh, I think, the Iowa Movers case back in 2003 or something in the, in the aid to public comment. Uh, but but I, I wonder if you can contrast the two. You know, what, what you propose sounds like a rule of reason analysis, and, and it doesn't strike me that that's the right uh, uh, approach for a rule, whereas you know defining what's active supervision, and maybe there are others, strikes me as a place where there could be some rule-based uh, 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 framework. Uh, so thank you. Uh, 
Uh, the reason I suggested uh, what I suggested for paper delay is that um, there is so much data. We have a lot of empirical data on it. So if you do it just once, so because of all the empirics, you can say that if this amount of money is exchanged and this amount of service is exchanged, well, I, don't have, uh, I don't have access to all the data, and so it's hard to describe what it is. But you simply do it once. In other words, you are essentially analyzing and processing the aggregated data, and you're then coming up with the rules that say if you see this, if it's contemporaneous with the agreement uh, to delay, delay entry, and it's never been done before, whatever it is, I, I can't make up the conditions now. Then there would be a presumption, okay? Mm -hmm. So it can be done every in every single case. So then you push the burden onto the defendant, and it's fair because the knowledge is in their position, uh, is in their, uh, uh, it, it, they have the information. They can more easily come out and come back and rebut it and say, okay, we did pay this amount, but we did, we got back this, 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 and this. And that is why uh, the, presumption does not fit in our case. We have rebutted the presumption. So I think a lot of money can be saved in that regard. And, uh, and these cases are taking so long, as Dick was mentioning. And by doing that, you can shorten the subsequent cases uh, much more. Uh, and I know, I, I think what you're talking about in state action is right. Uh, I think when I was policy director, they, uh, there was already a policy statement. Now, has that policy statement been Updated, or is it the same policy statement on what constitutes active supervision? It's still the same. Whereas, you know, what still, and just listening to you on the on the reverse payments, it just strikes me as a, you know forcing a rule of reason analysis into a slightly different format. And so I, you know, I, I, it, it doesn't seem to, it, to me, it doesn't seem to get to get you much. Whereas, you know, in some other areas, at least it may be um, workable and it may, um, uh, you know, may get you more than a, than a policy statement. I mean, a lot of what, as Maureen said on the hospital, uh, uh, merger matters. I mean, now, you know, the courts, both the agency and the courts, have a pretty clear framework of how they're thinking about them. Uh, that strikes me as, you know, have, have, had been developed through the case-by-case -case analysis, but has now shortened the analysis the same way, uh, I mean, if the agency were bringing reverse payment cases, uh, could, could happen, absent, absent a rule, uh, you know, as, as, as you described. So it, 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 I guess what I'm getting at is the rule, a rule seems like a very um, poor uh, uh, format to accomplish uh, uh, simplifying uh, cases where in fact, you know, the parties may have an efficiency justification or not, uh, or, or something other than efficiency justification. Uh, and I, I still don't see what you get from it other, outside of a, 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 you know, a policy statement or a, you know, case by case adjudication that, you know, eventually uh, the courts the courts accept as, uh, as a as a framework. I I actually think uh, it's it's amazing that I, I think between the marina and marine have have come up with the solution of a very important antitrust problem. Uh, I think these paper delay agreements are, are really quite devastating in their impact on consumers. Uh, uh, so I, I, I think the, the, a, a statement of the type that Marina was discussing that, that establishes a, uh, the, the, the framework uh, for decision making and that is includes, uh, incorporates a lot of the, the, the solid empirical evidence that the, the agency has, coupled with uh, Maureen's uh, suggestion that, well, we're not gonna try to go for damages, we're, we're, we're going under section three, uh, but I, in a sense I, I, I agree with your point that it doesn't have to be a substantive rule. I, I think what Marina is talking about 
could be done in, in the form of a guidance document or in administrative law terms, interpretive rule slash policy statement. Uh, and uh, it, it wouldn't be legally binding, uh, but, but it would then tell everybody exactly where uh, uh, FTC plans to go, and then uh, FTC follows that up uh, by uh, applying it or attempting to apply it in a, in a given adjudication. And uh, uh, I think there's a good chance that uh, it, it would uh, pass muster with, with, with the courts and be considered entirely consistent with the uh, uh, Supreme Court's holding and reasoning in, in, in Octavus. Um, so I, I actually think of, I'd love to see the agency do that soon. <laughs> Yes. I'm wondering if we might sort of zoom out a little bit um, to other regulatory agencies, other enforcement bodies, and um, are there uh, other agencies that have sort of done this rulemaking process either well or really badly that we can learn from? So, for, you know, for example, Professor Pierce, I know you've um, uh, done a lot of work in the energy and environment space, and are, are there are there lessons to be learned elsewhere for antitrust? Um, yeah, the lessons are it, it's always going to take a long time. Uh, <laughs> it's always going to be resource intensive, and it's always going to require significant empirical support in order to pass muster in 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 court. Um, uh, and uh, if, if you do that, then after you know, three, four, five years, uh, uh, you, you usually win. Um, uh, and that's across lots and lots of agencies. Now, that's under straight notice and comment, uh, the, 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 the Magnuson Moss version of notice and comment. It's a whole different animal, and we don't know very much about how the courts would respond to that after the, 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 the many, many years it would take to complete one of those proceedings. Perhaps one last question, very quick question, if any. No? So then we're good for lunch. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, sorry, there was? Oh, yeah. Bert, Bert. Just, just to wrap up on National Petroleum Refiners, uh, Justice Scalia was always very clear that what matters in interpreting statutes is what would reasonably have been understood at the time by the words in the statute. I'd just love to hear any thoughts you might have about what the Congress of 1914 intended with Section 6G. Well, I mean, one thing that we saw certainly uh, in the AMG case is, and I think Dick talked about this, is how does this fit in the overall statute, right? You're not going to extract a couple words out and, and interpret that uh, in, in a vacuum. Um, and the FTC was, you know, it had these powers under Section 6 to do studies and to do, you know, other things, but its real, you know, one of its key roles was Section 5 case-by-case -case enforcement. So I think you also need to look at where that rule is situated because it seems to be a little like uh, detached, I think, from kind of the core thing. And one other point I want to make is everyone talks about petroleum refiners as if it is a Supreme Court case. It is from one circuit, right? So uh, it is not binding in other circuits. Uh, it certainly might be instructive in other circuits, but if a challenge were to be done to FTC UMC rulemaking that went up through another circuit, that circuit is in no way bound by the DC circuit case. And I think sometimes that gets a little bit overlooked. I, I, I agree completely with Maureen on that. Uh, I, I just point out that there's, there's a lot of cases in which the Supreme Court has said, well, we're particularly influenced by an agency interpretation where first, it was the interpretation that the agency announced shortly after the statute was enacted, because that's the time when the agency is most likely to know what Congress intended. Uh, and second, when it has been the consistent interpretation of the agency. And that's where I get back to, oh, are they in trouble in trying to make this argument in, in the Supreme Court? Because 
what the agency said uh, initially was, no, this does not give us the power to issue substantive rules. It only gives us the power to issue procedural rules. And then it said that for what, all the way from 1914 until 1962. And it said it again and again in, in congressional testimony in, in many, many places. And, and wow, you've got a heavy burden to, to, to then convince uh, the Supreme Court. Gosh, the, the first commission had it all wrong and the commissions uh, that existed all the way from 1914 to 1962 had it all wrong. And, and all of a sudden, the, 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 the DC Circuit finds this one little reference to rulemaking power buried in the same sentence with power to, to require reports from, from uh, corporations. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really tough argument to prevail on. Uh, on that note, I think that's a great way to, to, to close up. Please join me in giving a round of applause to our great panelists. Thank you.